Hey, Jimbo, you ready for this deal? I don't know. <laughs> Old stories like long lost friends. Rodeos and late night bends. History before our time. Round pens and pasture rides. Cowboys of the Osage. Howdy, friends and neighbors. Time once again for the Cowboys of the Osage podcast with your host, Jimbo Snively and Cody Garnett. Now let's sing a little bit about it. Cowboys of the Osage riding once again. Always got some time for a friend. And here they are, the Cowboys of the Osage. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Cowboys of the Osage podcast, brought to you by the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum and the Buck and Flamingo Turquoise Shop, both located in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma. Hey, it's old Cody over here, and as always, I have my main man with me, Mr. Rodeo Historian himself, Jimbo Snively. Good morning, Jimbo. Who do we have here today? Hey, Cody boy. It's another great day in Osage, man. And, uh, Cody, you're getting that speech down pretty good. You used to mess that up. You know, we'd have to take it two or three times. Yeah, I'm after 120-something yeah, of these deals. finally got it. I'm about time I got one, Jimbo. <laughs> Cody, we've got uh, one of the most iconic cowgirls and Western women of our age, in my opinion, you know, uh, in Sharon Camarillo. Uh, she's a four-time NFR barrel racer. She's a member of the Cowgirl Hall of Fame down at Fort Worth. She won the Tad Lucas Award down in Oklahoma City, and you know we've been down there, and we know how prestigious an award that is. That's big time. That's big time. She's an entrepreneur. She's got a line of tack and saddles, and and she does barrel racing clinics. Just really a, an iconic figure in the Western world, and we're just really glad. I don't know what she's doing in Pusca. We're going to find out. She kept Leo in line, I think. Yeah, kept him in line for a while, but... Uh, Anyway, we're tickled to have her. And Sharon, welcome to the uh, Cowboys of the Osage podcast. Jimbo, it's an honor to be here in the Osage Hills. I, I think so many people around the country maybe got to see the Killers of the Flower Moon, mm -hmm. and they didn't realize the challenges that you all faced here and the, the wealth that's here right? and how it affected the Indians and really right up in today how it affected this whole area, not to mention the number of famous cowboys that came out of Pahuska. Yeah, yeah. We're really fortunate. To, this was just a real melting pot of cowboys and Indians and right. oil. Cowboys and Indians. And ranches. Yeah, yeah. it's great. I know. <laughs> we love it. Well, you're a long way from home. What are you doing in Pahuska? <laughs> you know, I'm a traveler. Uh, you mentioned that. I don't know how you got all that information on me. You must have read my Lion oh, Facebook every, page, SharonCamarillo.com. <laughs> but um, we did a clinic in Springfield, and my mother's from Springfield, so it's like going home. I got to have breakfast yesterday with some of my cousins and always enjoyed going to Missouri as a little girl. One of the things I remember, the doggone, you know, at that time, um, the little jumping insects that jump in my face so I must not have been more than about three feet tall but loved the shepherd of the hills and the Ozarks and right. and uh, so we really enjoyed my daughter Stormy worked with me we had a ball um, with the girls there in in Springfield in the area and then I have a great family friend Cindy Smith and she's from Texas so she ha she works for a school district and she said, I'd like to have a road trip. So she met me, sent Stormy home. She met me in Springfield, and we're headed down through. We wanted to see the, the Pioneer Woman and the Drummond Ranch and, and the Ben Johnson Museum. So we spent the night last night in the historic bed and bath. When we pulled up and it was dark, Cindy said, well, we're here. And I said... I'm scared. I'm kind of scared. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, I don't need anything much, but it was dark, and right. we had to follow the instructions, and there was no one to check us in, and you look in the drawer, and you get the room number, and right. and it was fun. We enjoyed right. it. Ooh, well, we're really glad you stopped by. 
felt uh-huh. like the Whiting. Y'all stayed in the Whiting last night. Yes. Up there on North Kaiheka Street. Okay. That's where we stayed. I think they uh, have people get these spoons with a key on them somehow. And did you have a spoon yes, on your key? Yes, we did yeah. in room yeah. number 18. Wow. And uh, you got to search your room out somehow and... I don't know where they even hide the spoons with keys on them. But oh, well, you walk in them. the hall. They go up the stairs. You walk in the hall. There's an old desk, probably from the 1800s. You pull out the drawer, and your name's on an envelope. And there's a spoon with a key in it. It tells you what room you're in. Wow! It has a TV in the room. Yeah. It has coffee in the morning. Clean as a whistle. Cool. But we were a little cautious when we first drove yeah, up because yeah. it was dark, and that that street is a little on the dark side. Yeah. But yeah. we just finished dinner at the Pioneer Woman's Mercantile. Wow. That was the best filet I've ever had. It was Ooh. delicious. And the biscuits are to die for. You're right here. You probably eat there every day, so well, you get don't, tired but, of it. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that. You know, glad to hear you liked it. And and what she's done to Pahuska. Oh, yeah. With the hotel and the gift shops and the candy stores and, and her television show. Yeah. It's amazing to see a great town revived. Right. You wouldn't yeah. even believe what she's done for here, honestly. Probably wouldn't be a Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum without Reed Drummond, would it? <laughs> I mean, you know, just no. to be honest. No, before she opened, we were just one of, like, four businesses open in this whole downtown area, and we were just a little pawn shop at that time. And uh, thanks to Reed, she's let us do all kind of fun stuff around here. Oh, she's an amazing, I love her show, I've watched it, you know, mm-hmm. diligence, diligently. And, and so I told Cindy, I said, one of these days we want to go through Pahuska. So, plus... You know, my one of my favorite events in pro rodeo is steer wrestling or uh, steel roping. Uh-huh. And I can remember sitting in the grandstands with all the wives of the steer ropers, and they were the toughest old gals, and they knew the rules, and right. they knew the details. And I just used to love that. I'd kind of get away from the barrel racers and sit up there with the steer ropers' wives, and that was fantastic. Right. Then Leo, you know, was a several-time champion of the – of the timed yeah. event, mm-hmm. and so he had to learn to steer rope, mm-hmm. and I went with him to practice as we'd stay in Arizona in a little yeah. bit and get prepared for that event. Well, I, I grew up as a little kid around Nell Shaw and uh, Jackie McIntyre, you know, <laughs> stuff, ladies like that. It was just a lot of good memories for me. Old stories yeah, like long lost friends. It kind of made me weepy because uh, Jackie McIntyre, what a fantastic Rodeos woman. Rodeos and late and night the history bands. of the McIntyres. In fact, we're going to have lunch with, with Susie and, history and Alice for tomorrow in Atoka. Yeah. And uh, so Reba, he, Round I hope everyone and saw her national rides. anthem at the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Great. I texted her the Cowboys next morning. I said, best ever. Of the she OC. said, my cheering section were watching down on me. And she had her granddad's yeah. buckle on and her mom's bracelet on right. and she said i had the most fun doing that than Howdy anything friends she'd and ever neighbors. done time once again for the cowboys of the osage podcast oh, with your host jimbo snively oh, yeah, it was great Cody i wish you had done an acapella without any music about. behind her but besides cowboys that i mean just so ama- and it, we got to see a world champion steer ropers buckle right, right, everybody so did in the whole world right, pretty much right, right. that day oh, First time, probably ever for the Super Bowl. I'm gonna have to say oh so. Oh my gosh, that, <laughs> would you ever put a bet down in Las Vegas that right, that would ever right. happen? That'd have been a good prop bet, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, How did uh, who did Leo get learn to rope uh, trip steers from in Arizona? Or help, helped him out to get ready for the timed event. You know uh, the Fishers, okay. Danny, okay, Danny Fisher. Okay. So he'd go down and rope with Danny, and I think several years he roped Danny rope on Danny's horses. I can't be absolutely mm-hmm. accurate, but we love them. And Danny came out to California at different times because we don't steer rope in California, mm-hmm. but he team roped, mm-hmm. and we really enjoyed him. And I've enjoyed watching the boys grow up and their success. And it was fun to see at the finals this year what all three of them were in the finals. Right. Am I right? Well, no, Dan didn't make them this year. A couple was, years ago, though, yeah, they were yeah, the they first have father's two yeah. sons to ever make yeah. it. Yeah, sure. it might have been a couple of years ago. I was thinking yeah. uh-huh. that this year, and I said, yeah. good on him. I'm so glad yeah. to see him. He's you know? finally slowing down. What is he, 72 or something? <laughs> now, <laughs> wait a minute. Slow down a little don't, bit. don't be that talking to so well, much about He's year still olds. making the finals <laughs> all the way up to 70, and he finally... No. You know, it's no, crazy that's what a great got family. Hey, one time I was in good position to make the finals. We were headed into the fall one time, Jimbo, and... uh Dan, something happened to him. He got kicked by a horse, and he was having to have surgery. And I'm like, well, that's one guy I don't have to worry about right there. Bull. He was only out for about a week. Came back from the surgery. Could hardly barely walk around. Oh, no. Tying steers in eight and nine. Oh, no. why? It's crazy. Fucked me right out of the finals. Oh, I saw on, on Facebook where he's tied one and 12 the other day somewhere down there. 
Yeah, probably had his own roping. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. 12 2. Crazy. That was amazing. Did it you took walk? me 12 seconds to get on a horse. You know, yeah. I've never, I met Leo one time and it was with the Fishers out in Prescott, Arizona when they added steer roping back to the, back to the rodeo and, um, He'd get in the box with every one of them, and I was like right in between them one time, and he stayed in the box with me. And you sure feel like you're going to win something with Leo Kim <laughs> Real standing in the box telling you that you're fixing to win something on this steer. And, yeah. uh, and if and if you don't break the barrier, he's going to yell you're out about as loud as anybody I've oh, ever man. heard in my life. <laughs> and uh, he was just a great hype man in the box. I didn't realize. A great competitor and really taught me so many skills, how to enter, how to win. Mm -hmm. uh, it was amazing. Uh, we met in California, of course. And, um, you know, when I graduated from college and went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is an iconic rodeo school, and that taught me a lot of my lessons, but I was a roper. I had a barrel horse, but it wasn't much. It was maybe for a few points for the all-around. But my passion was roping, team roping and breakaway roping. And if we had breakaway roping at that day when I graduated, I never would have run barrels. But I thought, wow, I'd won a national championship, and my career's over because I don't barrel race. So I had to figure out how to make a barrel horse because I couldn't afford to buy one. Went through a couple of horses, but I finally realized it wasn't about running around three barrels. It was really about good horsemanship. And I call my program today the art of barrel racing, which breaks down into the approach. And it's nothing more than straight lines. And you know, when you're riding a horse or a young horse, one of the hardest things to do is to ride straight lines. Get them going. They've got to drive from behind, get that front end out of the way, follow their nose, shoulder behind the nose. And then the, the rate, so the art of barrel racing, approach rate, and... You know, we see that so much in barrel racing, and one of the reasons it's the fastest growing, growing sport worldwide, and I've taught in seven countries, is that anyone can do it on any horse. It's a right and two lefts, a left and two right. But to be able to rate, balance, shift that weight, still getting those horses moving forward to set them up for the turn, the art, approach rate, turn. And then we really teach riding points through that turn, coming out close to their setup for the next barrel. And in this last clinic we did, you know, I said, girls, I've been watching you guys ride, and it's about 40 strides from the starting line to the finish line. 40 strides. Do you realize you've got to ride every single one of those strides? You've got to balance your horse every stride. Where is he? How is he approaching? What's he feel like? Is he too much on his front end? Is he driving hard enough? I said, so many of these girls today don't get their mind in the game. They come in that arena and think, how fast am I going to be to get back across the finish line to get a check? But it really, you've got 40 strides, or whatever the case may be. We go to Salt Lake City. It's a 12, 13-second run in the building. You know, I don't know. Maybe there's only 18 or 20 strides. But you've got to figure that out. That's part of the pregame warm-up. And all of that, um, those, those thought processes, really came from Leo Kim Rio. He always, he always evaluated the situation, the ground conditions, the size of the arena, the cattle, and figured out how to make his best choices for a win. Because really, at that in that day and time, if we didn't win, we didn't go the next week. Sure. Didn't have sponsors like they do now, probably. Not, not as many. I was with Court Saddlery for over yeah. 40 years. Leo was, too. Um, but primarily, at that in those days, we got product. And, and we had uh, Camarillo Enterprises, so we sold roping equipment and, and saddles and help courts with with their decisions so it was different at that yeah. day we right. we didn't really put logos on our shirts and you mentioned what how you're helping girls today and stuff and what you teach them was there any anything like that available to you uh, the first clinic i ever went to was a sammy thurman cl clinic i was so lost i didn't have a clue you know, I watched him go around the barrels. I could certainly go around the barrels, but how to get to a barrel, how to get out of a barrel, I had no clue. She was trying to teach me diagonals, leads, and it was over my head. And it really wasn't until I decided I needed to learn to ride that I got a clue in how to manage a horse. And I learned to ride through Bobby Ingersoll's, the great rain cow horsemen in California. I mean, we're heavy in that. Um, 
bridle horses, bridling a horse, balanced horses, how to count out stops, how to do 360s, how to um, get consistent leads, how to look where you're going. And, you know, at that point, um, I showed some rain cow horses, and I said, dang, this, this is just what we need in the barrel race. So I dissected the information that I thought would strengthen my barrel racing. And that made a difference in, in what, I, what yeah. I was able to do in the barrel race. As a little girl, how did you get interested in horses <laughs> and, and living story. in California? My dad was an aeronautical engineer. I was raised on the beaches of Southern California, Redondo Beach. And my dad was an adventurer. adventurer. He, he, at his death, he'd been to 75 countries. And he worked in the space program. And he'd take me on Saturdays down to the beach, and I'd ride the ponies when I was little. And I can remember him taking me off a pony in a ring and crying because I didn't want to get off. And then we traveled a lot. We went to a lot of the national parks. And most national parks have a dude string or pack station. That's where I wanted to be. I mean, I'd hang out over a pile of manure hoping with the optimism that there'd be a horse that would come mm -hmm. back by. And if I could touch one or feel that, you know, when they mm -hmm. breathe on you or snuggle your face, it just, and the smell. Um, I'd clean stalls, feed horses to just try to get a ride. And then luckily, one of our dear friends in Southern California bought a sales yard about 50 miles away from us. So I was able to go up and move cattle, work in the sales yard. Thought I wanted to be an auctioneer, wear a pink shirt and starch jeans and a great hat. And I thought, oh, man, that's the life. And uh, my dad made the mistake of taking me to the rodeo, the National Finals Rodeo in Los Angeles. And when I saw the barrel race and the excitement and those girls at that point in the May and, you know, fancy clothes. So we went back to the sales yard. We turned the trash cans over after the sale was over, and I got a bat because that was part of the information, you know, it was part of the, part of the repertoire, and we'd ride those poor cow ponies after working cattle all day around the barrels. That's where it started. Is that what they call a sale barn out in California, a sales yard? Stock yeah. yards? Yeah. Uh, well, Jack Pole, he um, had a sales yard, or okay. sales yard, auction yard. Yes, ma'am. And that was on Saturdays, and uh, part of the first of the swap meets that would come into the sale charts. You know, they'd, people would rent tables and bring in produce or gift items to sell, but we were moving cattle and sheep and goats through the ring, and then he had a small feedlot. But then his daughter, Wendy, and I would travel with him in the summer, and if we had any time off school, we'd go down into Blythe and um, Central California and round up cattle. We wouldn't round them up, but we'd pick them up and bring them back to the sale on Saturdays. So I loved that. It was really a great start. And I, my dad, I know he was sorry, maybe he introduced me to, you know, the event because then I was obsessed by it. So I just, uh, he wanted me to be a secretary when I grew up and needed to get an education. And I thought, I want more than that. No, no offense to secretaries, but I went to an agricultural junior college and then was drafted by Cal Poly into um, at Cal Poly in the rodeo team. Uh, I tried, I could go tie and I could rope, but I didn't have a barrel horse. So I did the best I could on the ground, learned my skills, was able to beg and borrow rides and uh, won a national championship. And with that said, if I can say it without getting emotional, because I'm so grateful that standing behind the podium at the National Calgary Hall of Fame, accepting an award, it makes you see, and I've told T. Woman, I've told so many guys that are coming into the hall, you're going to see your eight-year-old self down there. And you're going to wonder, how in the world did I get here? Because I never did one thing with the thought of being accepted into the Cowboy or Cowgirl Hall of Fame in mind. And all of a sudden, your life just kind of rushes by. You know, it's, a, it's amazing to see those champions cry like a baby in humbleness and gratefulness. All right. That'll bring it out of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love being able to do my clinics. Like I said, I've taught in 48 states. And my biggest regret is that I didn't keep a journal. I don't know what two states I haven't taught in. 
And uh, seven countries love sharing barrel racing. Probably the most remarkable place we went, Stormy went with me, went to Brazil. And I, I usually make a, a rule that no stallions at the clinics unless they're approved by either the sponsor or myself because, you know, they can be disruptive and dangerous. We got to Brazil, and um, we got in the arena, and I looked, and I said, Stormy, that's a stallion. We looked around. There were like, we had 20 horses. There were 18 stallions, a mare, and a gilding. <laughs> Crammed together, not a peep. I mean, those are remarkable horsemen in Brazil. And they've imported some really nice horses from the States. And then when we did our little jackpot that we do when we close our clinic, there were 250 Brazilians in the stands. And ay, 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 ay. <laughs> it, was a, it was a lot of fun. So... So most, a lot of their horses came, came from the United States? Yeah, and, and they have a program. I mean, mm -hmm. the horses that they're buying from the States, they have to be credentialed. They have to have a win record, bloodlines. And so they're, they took some really nice horses to, the, to Brazil and have established a remarkable uh, breeding program. In fact, I believe that the, the winning time on a standard course is a Brazilian horse. I can't verify mm -hmm. that, but... I read a lot. I don't retain a lot. Are there any, uh, I should know, but are there any Brazilian ladies in the PRCA now competing? Or do you know? Yes. Um, competing is, um, now you're going to put pressure the, on uh, me. The WPRA is what In I the mean. WPRA, yeah. yes. Uh, one of our Brazilian calf ropers, his wife, darling little girl, she competes in barrel racing. Costas. They live in Texas. Yes. Okay, well, I saw her yes. the other night. Constance. And she's, she's originally from Brazil? Yes. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. I did. I saw her. Yeah, her husband, yeah. world champion cat Sure, sure, I yes. knew him, from and I Brazil. saw him, and I just didn't put together Thank that you. she was from uh, Brazil, too. Then we also That's have good. a junior world champion team roper and all-around oh world gosh, champion Nicole. from Brazil. Yeah. Holy moly, yeah. what about that it's, guy? It's, he's unbelievable. I just love those guys. You know, I was a, a rodeo announcer for the Houston Livestock Show for 16 years, mm -hmm. and I love that being... Um, the champion in the arena, and then getting out and being on the other side of production. And I brought so much depth of knowledge to my interviews sure. because I rodeoed with those guys. Right. Um, it, was, it was just terrific to be able to um, tell the crowd what those folks had done and where they came from. You know, Cody and I got asked to do a little announcing last summer uh, steer roping a slack it was but it was like three go arounds of the same guys you know over and over and you, and you think of something to say about them the first time you know and then after the third go around you kind of run out of something to say you know and, and it was a lot harder than i expected it to be mm -hmm. so I, I admire those good announcers <laughs> well i i love i love that project uh today I wouldn't promote it because I just don't have the recall that I used to have. And I always laugh and say, I'd have to call for a commercial break to give you the rest of the information. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can plainly see and tell people what, <clears throat> how the run's going, what they're doing wrong, what cost them there, what made it such a good run without knowing anything about the cowgirl or the horse they're riding, I would assume. You know, everybody wants to talk about their horse, how it's bred, how much it loves it. How perfect it is, except sometimes, let me show you a run, and they go back and fumble with their cell phone, and when it's in the middle of all the traffic at the national finals over at the trade show, you kind of, okay, we need to pick this time up a little bit. And, you know, you, it's a postage side stamp, so you can't see what bridle or really what their hands are doing, and you can kind of see the direction they're going. But, uh, you know, Storman, I know when we get to our clinics, we go through their equipment, so we can make a note of what bridle they brought us. We're not going to change their bridle out unless we think we can make a difference in the change. And then we have them make a run. I say, if you're riding a young horse, we know it's a young horse. Go the speed you're comfortable in. If it's a finished horse that you're having trouble when you put your money down, go the speed that you compete so we can see the challenges you have with speed. After we're done, we take a lunch break. that We video that, and we have a program called Coach's Eye. And it's like a teleprompter, you know, like we've done at Houston when we've drawn um, diagrams around a barrel to explain what the barrel run was. And uh, so we can say, well, what are you looking at? Oh, I'm watching, I'm watching my points. Well, it looks to me like you're watching the barrel, and we can draw 
from the rider's eyes to the barrel. Where you look is where you ride. You're watching the barrel. More than likely, you're going to hit it or you're going to lose your position and not leave a barrel. So um, we give them three performance outcomes, things that we want to work on the next time when we take them to the arena. So we know more about their horses in, in those three or four minutes than they can tell us in, you mm-hmm. know, in, a, in a litany of discussion. When I was a kid, I remember a lot of the barrel horses came off the racetrack. You know, that, that was just, you know, if he wasn't, when he's done racing, let's make a barrel horse. He's fast, you know. But I imagine horses now are bred for barrel racing mm-hmm. probably more. You, well, you they, see a lot of difference in horses back then and, and, and now. You know, I've always liked a cow horse. I guess it comes from my rain cow horse. I've always admired a cow horse. It comes from the work in the sales yard. Um, I've always wanted cow horses and hoped they could run mm-hmm. versus a horse I knew it could run and hoped it could turn. You know, mm-hmm. there's a there's a, a different mentality on those horses. But, you know, the dash to fames, the race horses that have been great on the track and they've mm-hmm. crossed us, crossed them with some of the a little more mm-hmm. cold blood horses. Mm-hmm amazing today the goodbye lanes and the of course the blazing jetalinas and um most of the time you see a um a good mayor on the top that that's a running mayor mm-hmm. you're probably going to have a good potential but mm-hmm. regardless it takes a foundation mm-hmm. and so many times people get so anxious to enter that they enter before these horses are ready so a good foundation, and, you know, we don't work them on the barrels. We roped on all our horses, stopped them straight, got them to rate, pay attention to your seat, your legs, your hands. Um, and then the crucial time comes when you start seasoning these horses. You know, they're doing good at home. They're doing good at the little jackpot. We'll take them to a bigger race. You know, just getting them confident that they can go in that gate with the people, with the music, with the noise. That's a big deal, and I say more horses are ruined in that transition, in that seasoning stage, than any other time in their career. And then he's not going to make it, so they sell him, and somebody else buys a problem, and then you've got to slow down and not look forward to entering with the money that you spent and get that horse rebroke. So horsemanship never goes out of style. Right. I bet. And my good, you know, the Buck Brannemans, the... the um, um, Oh, I've got a great friend in, in Idaho that I just love. They're horsemen. They think horse. Mm-hmm. And I, I love to spend time with those guys and apply what I'm doing to their philosophies and vice versa. Because they'll, they'll watch my demonstrations at the horse fairs, mm-hmm. and then they come in, how would you learn to step to the outside? I don't know. It just makes the horse moves, keeps him straighter. Well, that's the right thing to do. So to be reinforced with the peers that you respect, Martin Black he, he's a thinker. He'll call every once in a while. Let me ask you about a barrel race. I just need to make sure that what I'm thinking is right. I want to hear it from you. Mm-hmm. And just to share those thought processes. I mean, you know, Jimbo, Cody, you know, it's like braiding and the wonderful things we see see um, the CCA do with the, you know, it comes from trial and error, learning from people that you admire, being able to climb up the rope to get to that level. It's, it's no different. I don't think in any sport, barrel racing, calf roping, team roping, et cetera. But you've got to have that will to win. You know, barrel racing here, the last several years, I think, has really taken a big <clears throat> turn compared to what it used to be. Now there's pretty big corporations with barns full of horses, and then they hire the best women jockeys to haul these horses to the rodeos. Mm-hmm. They're not even hauling their own horses, you know. Yeah, bloodlines are a science training a science it's amazing uh the fraternities that they have nowadays pink ruby buckles etc uh big money and we were talking earlier jimbo um well when was it you you were telling me and repeat this story so i can build on it the well, steer roping yeah i showed you a picture of the 1959 national finals and the, at that year they had the steer roping the team roping and the barrel racing all at clayton new mexico and, uh, and I showed you a picture. My grandfather won the average at the steer roping, and Jane Mayo won the average in the barrel race, and she was also the world's champion. But she won, uh, it was four go-arounds in the girl, for the girls, and she placed in every go-around, 
won the average, and she won $663. And we were figuring, okay, so she's at the national finals 2023. If she wins four rounds, that's $18,000 a round, and she wins the average. 28000 I think. 30000 a yep, round. 30, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 30, yeah, 32. I'm sorry. I'm a yep. year behind. <laughs> Let me get a commercial break, and we'll be right back with the information. <laughs> And then our what well, what the average pay seventy six thousand. So can you imagine that's one hundred and sixty thousand. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Look how far we've come now. My first year at the national finals was the same year that Reba sang the national anthem. Red Steagle was there. He did that great opening, sitting on the shoots, playing Freckles Brown, yeah. and they turned out the. Uh, tornado, tornado right. you know, you can't get any better than that. I don't want to see the Las Vegas showgirls, right. you know, at the, at the national finals today. Right. And so then Reba comes out, you know, and she tells, she tells the story. Everybody's heard it. I'll repeat it. She said, my girlfriend, and I want to go to uh, Oklahoma city and watch the national finals and just kind of play. And she said, she said, her dad said, Reba, what are you going to just go chase cowboys or what are you going to do up there? She, he says, if you're going, you need to work up there. Well, Daddy, you know, what, what would I do? He said, let's talk to Clem and see if you can sing the national anthem. So, of course, Clem McSpadden, friends of, you know, steer ropers and cowboys alike, he said yes. And th- the rest is history. And, you know, I'm so grateful to be a friend of Reba McIntyre because before that, we would sit on the grandstands and probably trash our husbands back and forth, you know. We watched the rodeo waiting for the barrel race to be up. So I knew her as a barrel racer. Mm-hmm. And she was just a lovely girl and a, and a wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when she sang the national anthem at the Super Bowl this year, I texted her the next morning and I said, best ever. She said, my cheering section. I mean, I said, look at Clem. He's so thrilled with you. And Jackie, your mama, so thrilled. And your dad, grandpap. She said, yes, my cheering section was looking down on me. And she said, so much fun. I said, well, as far as national anthem at the rodeo, 1974, I believe, or five, took you, where, where's this taking you? Yeah. You know, I mean, she's, oh, gosh, I got to see her uh, in New York City. And Annie, get your gun. Have you ever seen her do start anything? She doesn't finish at the top. Right. They recently had a had a reception for her on her new book, Reba, Not That Fancy. And uh, while, we, while we were there, she had a little reception in the back, and a man came that we didn't know. He was from the New York Times and presented her with a plaque that she'd already made the New York Times bestselling list. Hmm. Wow. Ain't that something? And, you know... What hasn't she done? We we love her. That's why we all love her. What a great ambassador for our way of life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. For Oklahoma. Dad a world champion. Yeah. <laughs> and Granddad still a world eats champion. Tater tots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, tater tots are good. Yeah. Yeah. I said I said, Did you and Rex love well, you everybody's heard this story, I'm sure, but her agent, she said, called her to see if she would sing the national be interested in singing the national anthem. And she said, Well, let me think about it. And Rex was in the room and he said Heck yeah, she's going to sing the national anthem. <laughs> yeah. And I laughed because I said, that's probably box seats, you know, front row seats at the, at the Super Bowl. So later I texted her and, and I said, did you have fun? She said, so much fun. I said, hot, hot dog? She said, two apiece. Uh, wow. <laughs> well, she you know, good. that's something we all do, you yeah. know? It's right. just, we meet some, you know, Jimbo, you've met so many people in your career in the pro rodeo. And, you know, it's not easy to, it's, it's a traveling game. It's not easy to travel and keep your horses sound and keep, you know, heck, in the early days we were on the phone trying to get entered, trying to get yeah. June Ivory to answer the phone right. before the entries closed. Right, right. At the truck stop, because right. we didn't have cell phones. Yeah, pay phone, yeah. We got into town to find the rodeo grounds. I'm really aging myself, but it's, it's great stories. It's fun. You know, we'd get on the CB radio. Hey, truckers! You know, this is California Cottontail. Where's the, where's the rodeo in town? And they'd tell you how to get to the fairgrounds. You know, I heard back in the old days they used to tell people to look for the uh, water tower because the rodeo grounds was always near oh. the water tower. Yeah, don't know about it, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, we were just lucky to get from one town to another and not have flat tires and right. truck problems. And you know, um, today it's it's different, but it's no easier. 
The yeah. miles are still as long. People uh-huh. ask me. I said, the miles, a mile's still a mile. Still a mile. When you're driving from Calgary to, you know, to Colorado Springs, or you're driving from Houston to, my word, Tucson. My first trip to Houston from California, we got to El Paso. No, we got to Van Horn. And it said Houston, a thousand miles, and all of a sudden, I thought <laughs> I've gotten too far away from home. We did a podcast with somebody from Texas one time. They said, "Golly, we went to Cheyenne. We were going to Calgary, and said we got to Cheyenne, and Calgary's another thousand miles." Oh my! <laughs> oh my! Well, my, Stormy, my right. daughter, she traveled a lot with us, and so she was pretty good about home. We didn't really have homeschooling then, but we'd take her out of school three or four or five days, and she'd have a package of homework to do. But Leo would say, okay, we're, we're 120 miles from Albuquerque. I want you to spell it when we get there. So she'd right. study the road signs, and it was fun. And then we'd play games on, on the radio, you know, who can right. name that country song first. Right. And right. we'd have some spats in the truck and, mm-hmm. you know, great yeah. memories, really. I, I don't think I'd want to go back and do it again, but... What I wish I did is kept a journal. Yeah. You could write a book, have a bestseller now. <laughs> I don't know if I could <laughs> or not. I wouldn't tell the stories. What kind of rig were y'all rodeoing in? Well, when we first started, we had a Lincoln Continental. And then we had a Mercury Marquis because they didn't have trucks big enough to pull right. trailers. So we had uh, a two-horse trailer, put our clothes in the back seat, and we, we traveled with a rabbit and um, T. Woman, when he first started working with Leo, he said, I didn't know the guy was so, he, well, he'd been to a school, so he knew a little bit about him. And he said, I pulled up in the motel, and Leo's down on his hands and knees underneath the truck or a car. And he said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to catch my rabbit. Rabbit. And T. just always laughed at that. But he rode in the back seat, and he had a little box of alfalfa hay. And he chewed every telephone cord from California to Mississippi. You know, we'd stop, he'd come into the hotel room, chew the cord, <laughs> chew. Bob Tallman would try to get a hold of us, and cord was gone, that damn rabbit. Crazy. How did Leo recruit T to, to rope with him? Uh, well, you know, he and Gerald and he and Reg were doing roping clinics at that time, and T was a young man and came to the roping clinic. And they were so impressed with his ability to catch those horns. So those great headers like T. Woman and um, Jake Barnes and D. Pickett yeah. and H.P. Evitz, you know, Reg Camarillo, I mean, yeah. outstanding you, you header. You probably knew one of the Huskers, one of our favorite sons, uh, Johnny Miller. Absolutely. Miller. So I went to call uh, Barbara, his wife. Yeah. She was at University of Arizona. She was dating a friend of ours that rodeo college mm-hmm. rodeoed, and then she married John. Mm-hmm. And now remind me John's brother's name. Benny Bob. Benny? Benny Miller. Benny, Ben, yeah. Yeah, Ben. And his, uh, his yeah. uncle was Ben the actor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But his brother, we call him Benny Bob. Benny Bob. And Johnny was Johnny Joe. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're so delighted to be in Pahuska here to go through the the um, Ben Johnson Museum. I mean, golly. Yeah. You know, as a, as a fan of old westerns and Ben Johnson and Rodeo Cowboy. You sure. know, that's what was so fantastic. Right. My family, we got tied a tea woman, too. The, the great steer roping horse he used to have, old Dutch, came from my dad. He made the, my dad made the finals on him four or five times before we sold him to, to T. Oh, my God. Oh, Dutch. I remember Dutch. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Didn't he go through, uh, who bought, did somebody buy that horse, the Betancourts or the? My dad bought him from the sale in La Hunta, Colorado, and we owned him. My dad made the national finals on him several times, and we sold him to T. Well, and the rest was history. Was there a family that kind of helped T get along that bought him that owned yeah, him? Yeah, I think one of the, T's guys that is helping him go down the road yeah. actually bought him for T, and then, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. He, re, he he remained in T's mm-hmm. custody ever. Mm-hmm. Is he still alive? Dutch still alive? Oh, I no, just died not I too would, long ago. Yeah. He lived a long time though yeah. for an old horse. Well, you know, it's it's uh, nice when those horses take you so many miles and so many accolades that they get to retire on the pasture. Like <clears throat> Leo's horse, Superstick, mm-hmm. is buried on our property. We had a great horse from the from the Yates's, Colorado, we called him, my head horse. He's on the property. My horse, Seven, the be- the horse that I like the best at the national finals, he's on the property. 
I know Jimmy Monroe, she lost her horse on the road up in Wyoming one summer, Billy, and mm-hmm. she loaded him in the trailer and brought him home to the ranch in Waco. You know, you have to honor those horses. Well, we never did. We, we always <laughs> sold them before. So let, them get, let someone else have them. And yeah. most of those people, we <clears> sold <throat> a lot of those great horse, steer open horses too that my dad made. They, they did die mm-hmm. on their property and they are buried on their mm-hmm. property. We were always just too broke to keep them around. Mm-hmm. If someone came wanting to buy them, my dad was real bad about pricing them. So, well, was your dad a rancher and a horse trainer? Or yeah, he's a horse standing trainer? right there. Uh huh. He grew up at the sale barn in Clovis, New Mexico. Oh, hello! I'm looking forward to meet you. That's a, <laughs> that's amazing. But specialized in steer roping horses. He was a saddle bronc rider, and a, he did every event, but ended up specializing in steer roping. Yes, ma'am. That's everybody and everything we have, mm-hmm. and everybody we know came from the rodeo world and. The steer open world in particular. What an amazing event, really. That horse has to run up on those cattle. He has to give you a chance to, to rope and set that trip. And then he's got to pull until he knows he's not. And, you know, I'm I'm an amateur going over those rules. But then <laughs> right. he's got to not drag the steer while you're trying to time. Yep. She's I mean, got it down. Similar she to a it. calf horse. Yep. She's got the whole deal down. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Help me remember. I'm showing my age. Um, 20 times world's champion steer roper. Probably talking about Guy Allen. Guy, Guy Allen. 19, 18 or 18, 19. 18, Jimbo knows. It was amazing. 18. I'm on the board at the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City, and that's quite an honor. So we're just getting ready to have our spring meeting the end of the month, and we go through the nominations. So once we pick the top 40, I believe it is, or 20, I don't remember. And then it goes out to the memberships and they vote. Mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine that T-Woman wasn't in the in the hall. And Guy Allen was not in the mm-hmm. hall. They put him up more than once, Guy <clears throat> Allen, I believe, and he didn't get in. I was like, well, what I, are I, they doing? He owns, he owns more Well, I think there was some controversy whether he was complete, had been retired long enough. Yep. There was a little that gray area of. there for the first time, I think. Well, I asked our president, it. you know, um, uh, Kelly Riley. Kelly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You know, anymore it takes a team to get a conversation. Yeah, well, it's it, whatever it's it kind of like a trivia contest. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I'd ask Kelly, I said, my word, he says, Sharon, they they got to be nominated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and right. And there's a lot of great cowboys out there that absolutely deserve to be in the hall. And if somebody, any of you out there, are rec- uh, recognize a great name that hasn't been inducted into the hall or considered for um, induction, please um, turn their name in mm-hmm. because we go through those names and we right. we pull out those folks that we want to send out to the membership. So thankfully, Guy Allen, both Guy and sure. T got nominated yeah. or right. nominated and, and inducted the right. same year. And those were two of the guys that I said, be careful now because you're going to get up there with all those people watching you in yeah. admiration. And all of a sudden, your life's just going to flash. And here are those two men who backed in the box and had to be, you know, 13 or 12 or whatever to win that average at Cheyenne. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. They, they just tears like a baby. Yeah, the cold-hearted, <laughs> no emotion, you know, of roping, you know, just cut your heart out, you know. And, and But then get up there and cry like that. Oh, yeah. You know, break a barrier for $1,200 or right, whatever, a right. little amount of money they were going to win and just shrug their shoulders and go to the next one, you right, know? Right. That's right. Yeah, you got to rope through the bad luck You got until it turns great, back to good luck for you. That's a, you, <laughs> that's a great statement. I mean, rope through the bad luck, that's just keep it going until it turns back around. Sometimes easier said than done. Yeah. Well, as long as I had a checkbook to write a check out of, I was all right until <laughs> that caught up with me. Is that dad? Is <laughs> dad make sure there were money in the Um, He did bank? his best. He didn't. He, <laughs> no, none of us had any money, but he did his best to help me for he sure. He was trying to enter himself, wasn't he? Yeah, he was trying to enter himself the same time I was entering. Yeah. yeah. But he did a good job trying to. Yeah, it was one of my best memories. Uh, when I was going for the rookie of the year, we, we hauled together that year, and it was just a great year. Ended up at Pendleton. Don't you wish you'd have kept a journal? Are you yeah, remember, yeah. Remember, well, I was drinking beer off of heart that time too. It'd been a little bit sloppy writing, but yeah. You know who we knew, what June Ivory 
why she was mad, Leo would send me into the office to pay our entry fees because she didn't like him. And she gave me a cussing. Why in the world did I marry that fellow? <laughs> Rodeo secretaries seem to get awful grouchy oh, through their me. years for some reason. They, they must have to put up with yeah. an awful lot. Kind of like some of school teachers, you, know, oh, you just have to put up with so much. Just... I, I just can't believe Sonny Deb. I mean, she's raised the Survey Boys. I mean, I don't know how many other young bronc riders and... She don't seem that grouchy, person. though, old Sunny. No, she's got a great... Well, she came from a long... You know, her mother was a, a terrific secretary, and her dad rodeoed, so, you know, she, she'd she been brought up through it. I guess she'd been seasoned before she got to be a professional secretary. Sharon, um, a pretty hot topic in the news here in the last week or so was the, the guy winning a million dollars at, uh, at the American. How do you come down on that? Uh... It's amazing. I was talking to my good friend, Jimmy Monroe, this morning. She's mm-hmm. president of the WPRA. Right. And I, I said, what do you think of the outcome of the American? And she, Jimmy's, she's a politician. Yeah, right. And she has such a cute giggle. She just chuckled. And she said, well, you know, actually, he's knocked barrels down for three years or so in a row to not win it. Yeah. And... um you know, he won it fair and square. I think he got a little close to that third barrel. But um, he was the only man, only person to win the million dollars. Mm-hmm. So he, right. he won it clean. Right. Um, somebody sent me a text, do you think men ride better than women? And I said, no, I don't think they do. I mean, the percentage of winning men are much smaller than the percentage of women. But, you know, it's been a women's sport for so long. I, I don't know. That we won't see a change in the WPRA, I don't no, believe. Sure not. But I don't know, you know, what I see on Facebook, most of the barrel racers are coming out in support of it, and it's guys like me that are griping about it, you know, and I don't know why that is. Because we're old-fashioned. Well, I like to watch a pretty lady ride a fast horse, you know, and it just, the optics didn't start the same with a guy to me. And, and, and the other thing, the, the lady's only had two chances out of eight events to win that million dollars. And he took one of those away. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. so I just, Brandon Cullen, yeah. you know, he was, he was from the East Coast right. and, and very significant fraternity rider. Right. He's in Texas now. Right. Uh, and a great guy, uh, what everybody says, you know, yeah. and I don't. Uh, Quiet. Yeah, I'm glad you won. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, but he I probably just, trains a lot of the top yeah, horses right. winning at the NFR every mm-hmm. year. I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. It just. Well, it's, I had somebody say something the other day. Well, it's not quite the same, you know, when you were ro- rodeoing. Um, you know, things have changed in the barrel race. And mm-hmm. I said, you know what, you're never going to tell me that horsemanship goes out of style. Right. You look at Lisa Lockhart. You look right. at Jordan Briggs. They're two-handed to their barrels. They sit. They ride those corners. they got a plan. Come down the alleyway. Break out on the correct lead. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, it's something that not every rodeo fan knows, but I do know. Um because my mom used to go to fraternities, and I think she won the one in Guthrie once, and maybe Fort Smith once. And uh, there's a lot of men that goes to the fraternities even back then, and compete right against all the women at the barrel racing fraternities yeah. ever since the '80s that I know of. So uh, it's just the governing body mm-hmm. that there's- the American takes their qualifiers from. They allow men to run in that association. Mm-hmm. So. But they're still billed as a rodeo, the American rodeo. And it just, I've never seen a guy at a rodeo run a barrel. Well, well, <laughs> a lot of changes. <laughs> and, and I don't know enough to go into it. Teton, Teton Ridge brought in a lot of mm-hmm. money. Right. They made a lot of rule changes. So they've changed the focus on the American. And, uh, there's a lengthy, uh, qualification program. And I kind of tell Stormy if she was a little girl and was wanting to qualify, I don't think we'd invest in that qualification. It's pretty tough. I mean, mm-hmm. if if you've got that really great horse that hasn't been outrun, you know, everywhere you go, so, you know, it's hard to keep a good horse from winning. Right. I don't know what that little fine line difference is. You know, you can try hard, get them set up, make those runs. But there's just some horse, you make a run, even if you step out wide on a barrel, you still clock. The stride coming home, mm-hmm. how, how fast they go into a barrel, whatever mm-hmm. the case may be. Yeah. And um, it's, it's hard to keep a good horse from winning. I guess if you have that horse, then you, you know, you're going to bet on yourself. Mm-hmm. But if you're just one of the masses that goes to those 
hoping Mm -hmm. it'll work. Mm -hmm. It's not just one run, then you qualify to qualify. And, and I can't, I can't and don't know the details of that, but, um, you know, it's a, it's pretty tough. It's, you know, something the American did do, I do got to tip my hat to these guys on this, is they brought the women's breakaway from not an event to an event. The year uh, mm-hmm. Mike Uthier's daughter, Madison, won it. There wasn't any breakaway in any of the big rodeos or anything. But that next year there was, and the next year there was more and more and more. And now it's out in Vegas. So they ain't running it with the rest of the rodeo for some crazy reason, but it's out there. And they're open for big money. Well, I was talking to Jimmy this morning because I've got a vested interest in the breakaway roping and a couple of designs I'm creating. But um, there's over 500 rodeos this year that have approved breakaway roping. Two years ago, there was 150. And, you know... I think it's from the American, though. I think that's the reason. Because we didn't see anything in breakaway. Just some... Rodeos mm-hmm. here and there down in Texas, All right. like when Mac Altizer had a bunch of rodeos. But after that Madison Uthier won all that money, mm-hmm. and the breakaway was on the biggest stage in rodeo at that time, mm-hmm. it just exploded the sport, mm-hmm. I feel like. Well, the, the girls leave in college. You know, their careers are over as far as professional competition unless there is a breakaway. So I think there was a little pressure there. I mean, it's an exciting event. It's easy for the stock contractors to put on. They just have to bring right. a it's quick. few little yeah. extra crowd loves it. It's easy to yeah. understand. When when I started in the 70s, again, I'm dating myself, we had hand flags. Yeah. Do, you, do you know to watch that horse mm-hmm. come across that line, see him come across the line, think, drop the flag, goes up to the secretary in the box, she thinks to see the flag, and then she stops the watch. There's There can be two, three-tenths of a second in between there. Um, It took us quite a long time to get a timer, get timers, get them distributed to the stock contractors. And this is crazy. For for a few years, the first three in each event had... You're talking about barrel racing, Yeah, barrel racing. At the line instead of of a timer. Had had to to, uh, set the course and set the timer. Now, wait a minute. I'd always tell Jimmy, who was president at that point, too, this is nonsense. Those guys don't have to set the barrier in the calf rope, and why do we have to set the the score and the timer? You know, I'm always a a controversy. They'd have to set up the barrel pattern, too. Yeah, we set the barrel pattern, and then we would be... Top it all off, they couldn't lose their hat in the arena, or they got a a fine or a no time or something. They couldn't lose their hat. Don't lose the hat. What? And then if you were the one that set the course, you know, we have to set our courses according to the size of the arena. We'd like to set a standard, of course, which is 60, 90 between first and second, 105 to the third. You go to Salt Lake City, it's a 12-second run. I mean, it may be, you know, 30 feet between the first and second barrel. So... If we set it, and there's always somebody that's going to tell you, well, you set the third barrel shorter because your horse runs by, or, you know, you set the course shorter because you're, you know, there's always a reason why whoever set it, I said, you know, we all have to run on it. Let's just make, make our best run. But um, so, you know, the girls in the, in the breakaway this year get half the money as the barrel racers. Next year they get three quarters, and in... In 2026, they'll get full money. When will they move to the Thomas Mac? Uh, there was just a meeting in in Colorado in um, Colorado Springs. It's ridiculous, they're not there. Yeah. And Jimmy thought it's still going to take two or three years because okay. there's politics. There's politics involved. And, you know, we got a two hour rodeo in TV Las Vegas. Time, it's not that. two hours and five minutes right. because our sponsors, which are the casinos, want you back, back in the there. restaurants. Sure. So to add that, what is it? 12 to 15 minutes Probably. to do the breakaway mm-hmm. roping. Right. You know, I say take away some of the dancing girls in the opening ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. Take away the intermission. Take that concert. Just take away the intermission. Take, take away that concert the at the beginning of the rodeo. You do the national anthem in that little concert. Always take away the concert. Take away the intermission. Anyway. Take away it all. Do the grand, grand entry national anthem. Get to rodeoing. Right. Okay, Jimbo, Cody, I say let's take a vote and make it happen. Right. Okay. <laughs> Who in favor say aye? Aye. <laughs> The only ones that wouldn't be in favor of all this money for the breakaway ropers and getting in the 
Vegas probably be the steer ropers, you know, they're because well, they because because they're still running for eight thousand yeah. dollars a go round and. That was our problem in the 70s. You know, I was an advocate to Jimmy Monroe, our president. Jimmy, we need a woman on the board. And she said, Sharon, we need to work with our sponsors as a, as a whole, a woman's event, to get our equal money. Because if we go on the board, the team ropers don't have equal money. I, didn't, I don't know at that time if the steer, steer, the steer, the steer ropers, ropers have never had equal mm-hmm. money, no. ever. So, um, you know, a lot of poly- – Look where we've come from. Oh, it's, yeah. It, it's unbelievable, unbelievable, really. And it's getting better every day, so we really haven't got anything to grab about. But. People still say, oh, we wish we were in Oklahoma City. or Right, you know, right. And then they, didn't they just renew the contract yeah, in but Las look Vegas? Well, yeah. Yeah. You can't go, yeah. you can't yeah. go anywhere else. No, I thought no. it might go to Dallas, but it's not, going not after I went out there the last time. Nothing can compete with Vegas. With Vegas. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. What was the atmosphere like in the Oklahoma City National Finals? Oh, man. Well, you told us about Red playing the guitar and they turned it oh, out, yeah. tornado behind him, and Reba singing the national anthem. And Sharon Shoulders, she'd always have her little pot, and for a dollar we'd pull out each event. Mm-hmm. She had a little drawing, you know, where that was fun for us rodeo wives. Uh, it was downtown. There was no place to warm up. So we'd go into the street, across the street to the median, and I was down there not too many months ago, and I could still see the median, which is now, which was then only six foot wide with trees. That's where we'd warm our horses up, and half the time the snow was blowing sideways. You know, you said on those lower seats in Oklahoma City, you better have a coat because that cold wind would come up that alleyway. I remember uh, Hawkeye Henson, he had a big old buffalo coat he wore, and Bobby Brown, you know, they had these big coats. But, um, it was exciting, and, you know, I know when we moved to Las Vegas, there were many fans that did not come with us. My seats now are row A because our box in, in Oklahoma City came with us to Las Vegas. And there were many that didn't make that transition. But after a couple of years, they came on in. Oh, yeah. yeah it was Those are some very valuable seats you got down there on row A, I bet. They're pretty nice. Movie star seats. Well, they used to be front row. You know, do you guys remember the day when there was a band at the rodeos? Yeah, a lot of time in Oklahoma, there was a prison band at the rodeos. I remember the uh, 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 Floyd Rumford and them used to haul around an organ player with them. <laughs> yeah, an, an organ. organ. <laughs> well, so our seats at one time were right there at the moat, and then they had the band right in front of us. So my son would hang over there and watch the band. And then they built the the gold buckle seats, you know, so there's five rows and then row A. But uh, I'm so excited for David Alexander. He's saddles to symphony, and he's getting at the Oklahoma City during the uh, award ceremony. Um, Career, a a lifetime achievement for his music. And he sings kind of a symphonic um, swing, kind of Bob Wills goes Mm to, mm -hmm. you know, the symphony. (laughs) And he was our band because I was an announcer when we were in the Astrodome. And he'd start, I said, you know, David, I can't believe it. Roy Cooper, not his head, the band would play. <laughs> Roy Cooper would throw his hands in the air, the band would stop. And yeah. then, you know, was, uh, you know. Well. We've seen a lot, you oh, know, yeah. isn't it? It's just so much fun. The be- One of the best books out is, um, um, let me think just a minute. That recall, let's see, this is a this is one of those um I can't Mel help Potter. You on this. Mel Potter, I know, I couldn't get it out. <laughs> he wrote a book. Um, and uh, Ed Ashcroft, who is a, a cattleman in Douglas down on the border, he's got about twelve or fifteen books out. Ed Ashhurst. And he Mel sent him tapes and he got Mel's history. And Mel talks about all of that steer roping, the history of rodeo. I, I started out with uh, sticky notes. I started reading his book, and sticky notes, sticky notes, stick, 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 you know, I had 40 sticky notes. And I called him. I said, would you be on my podcast, Mel? And he said, well, I'll do anything. Yes, yeah, Sharon, but I don't know what a podcast is. I said, well, let's say formerly known as a, a radio show. Right. So he was on that show. But if anybody gets a chance to read that, it's great history of rodeo. And Is it Mel Potter and Friends? Is that the name of it? Yes, it is. You know... Every year, around Christmas time, 
We used to get a bag of frozen cranberries in the mail from old Mel. Oh, gosh. Frozen. You probably did, too. Well, I don't know. Never, I think we end up freezing did. them. <laughs> it was just a bag of cranberries he'd send everybody for Christmas <laughs> with a card. Oh, I don't think they were frozen, but they always ended up frozen at our house. Mm-hmm. We had a whole freezer full of them before we oh. moved from Kansas. Sharon, if you were making a Mount Rushmore of cowgirls, doesn't have to be barrel racers. Doesn't, they could be trick riders or old bronc riders back in the day. Who would you put on it? Need four names. Have to say Jimmy Monroe right off the top. She's done so much. World's champion, multi-world's champion, rancher, legacy, 101 ranch, you know, knows the history of, mm-hmm. of rodeo and respects it. Um, 20 years in total, not continuate, continuous, but um, president. Mm-hmm. Martha Josie has to be there. I've never respected her more than I do today. You know, as a competitor, sometimes you there's an edge with a competitor. What she started out in the 70s to do, her and Ari are amazing. I'd have to say, Edith Happy, what a beautiful, she was married to Lex Conley, an mm-hmm. announcer, mm-hmm, sure. uh, a beautiful trick roper. Those women, you know, we've got several trick ropers in the Calgary Hall of Fame. That used to be an event at the rodeo, trick roping back in the day. You know, oh, it wasn't just an exhibition, rope. yeah. And did I, say, did I say trick roping? Yeah, you meant, meant trick riding. Trick, trick yeah, but riding. the trick riding yeah. and trick roping both were events yeah. back in no. the day. It wasn't just an exhibition like it would be no. now. Need one more. Reba McIntyre. There you go. Thought uh, she might have put Betty Gale Cooper on there. Well, hell. Well, you, you only know, get I'm four, sorry. though. You know, everybody has trouble. Tad Lucas. Absolutely. Thought she might have put old Tad, Tad on there. Tad Lucas. Yeah, I know. It's hard to just pick What four. about Mabel Strickland? Yeah, old just go go on. She's the one that, you know, the famous... Girl that tied steers down yeah. and rode Bronx. Oh my gosh! Right. Know. You know when I at the Calgary Hall of Fame, you see those old pictures, and Jimmy's donated several from the 101 Ranch and the Buffalo Bill. You know, mm-hmm. you see those women riding Bronx and tying steers down in my in my bar at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a lady make a painting for me, and it's one of those pretty women in the turn of the century, twenties probably. Yeah. She's got the the great bloomer pants on, pants tucked in her boots. She's pretty blonde hair. Well, those hats they used hat, to wear. Big mm-hmm. hat. I know. And she just tied a steer, and she's on one leg with her hands in the air. It's just, and with a smile. Mm-hmm. Is that Mabel? With a smile. I think it might be Mabel. I don't know. It certainly could. It was a copy of I think it's Mabel. A yeah. Copy of That's one of the most famous right. rodeo mm-hmm. pitchers, period, yeah. of all right. time. I think it was at the Pendleton Roundup. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the artist today, Donna House Sickles. Mm-hmm. She's in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, she's in Texas. Donna House Sickles. I think she's Texas. She paints the most beautiful women. Uh, they've got big smiles. They're pretty. You can see their hearts are friendly. They're not trying to steal your husband. They just want to have a good life, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Run their business, raise their children, wife, run the ranch. And, you know, golly, Ruby Goble and some of those women that are in the Calgary Hall of Fame that ran those huge ranches in New Mexico themselves, you know, after the grandparents passed. It's amazing what women have done. It's amazing what men have done, and it's amazing what couples have done, working together. Right. You, you uh, taught in seven countries. You told us Brazil, obviously U.S., and probably Canada. What are the other four? Brazil, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, France, Australia. Wow. What's California. it like over there in Europe? <laughs> California. <laughs> what's it like over there in Europe? What's, do they have a deep respect for our Western culture? What's, what's going on over there? Well, they've seen barrel racing, you know, on TV a little bit, and they've tried to emulate what we do without a lot of foundation, I've found. Um, horsemanship. We teach a lot of horsemanship. My equipment's designed around horsemanship, you know, getting a horse broke in between your hands, control front to back, realizing neck, shoulder, rib cage, hip needs to be balanced. You don't just get on and kick and go get a plan. Um, The Australians, the Brazilians are the most amazing. They're gutsy. They go faster than they probably should. They make things happen. The Australians love to have fun. They're fun-loving. That's, that's fun. Uh, they brought me into uh, Germany and Switzerland. Stormy and I both went to show the 
Quarter Horse Association that there was a rhyme and reason behind barrel racing because they wanted to bring it into the association. Formerly, all they saw were some men gee-hawing through the barrels, pretty aggressive, Mm -hmm. and they didn't want to bring that into the Quarter Horse Association. So we came in with more of a program and, and the foundation of what it takes to make those barrel horses. So they have barrel races over in Europe and stuff? Mm-hmm. Yes. China. What? So if you ever get a chance, Google Chinese barrel racing. It's a little bit more like an um, uh, amusement park ride, I think, because they came over and, and are buying barrel horses, sending them back to China. I knew, know a fellow that spent six months down there teaching, and he said, mm, you know, it, it's tough. They don't know horsemanship. So, but they're brave. So they'll get on a horse, kick him around one left, two rights, one right, two lefts, and then they almost have a guy like a, a hook on a jet plane landing on a carrier, and they catch that <laughs> rain on the way out of the gate. That horse swings around, as you can imagine. They get him off, and next wow. one goes. It's pretty wild. But and they've got, they've got. 100,000 people, and then the grandstands cheering. It's like a bull riding in Brazil. Wow. I never knew that. You know, I bet there's a barrel racer just waiting to be discovered in Mongolia. Those guys <laughs> are some horsemen <clears throat> oh, like you gosh. wouldn't believe. Who was the, who was the uh, pickup man that just retired, young man? I mean, he's 41. I, I read the story. And uh, he retired to spend more time with his family and not be on the road. I think he worked. I'm not even sure. I can't carry on that that story. But his next challenge is he's going to Mongolia to ride in that cross-country race. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, some of my best memories, and I'm glad this is the way I was raised, we were raised on the road with a family. You know, we didn't go to homeschool or anything like that. But if they were gone, we went with them. And that's just the way it was, you know. And... uh Heck, the rodeo road feels more like home than the home sometimes. Under the know? grandstands, you get a whistle from Dad, and you better start running back to the ring. I got off. so much trouble under them grandstands, <laughs> you wouldn't even believe. I got so much trouble under the grandstands, you wouldn't believe. One time we were at Cheyenne, and uh, he was up somewhere that night. And I'd wandered off to the carnival. Couldn't find me for two or three hours. And they were late. And uh, we got to that rodeo just to see oh, his steer get turned out. Oh, boy. Boy, the guy he was hauling with was mad at me that day, though. You didn't do it again, did you? <laughs> probably. I probably well, did. Well, look at the productivity of the McIntyre girls. You know, yeah. Jackie, she married and raised children. Her mm-hmm. goal was to be a singer. Mm-hmm. So she kind of lived through Reba. Reba tells the story, you know, when um, Red Steagle got the contract for them, you know, Jackie hauled Reba. And uh, I guess they were going to go maybe sign the contract. I'm not sure. Reba will have to correct that. But Reba said, i got to go to the bathroom, Mother. And then, Let's get an ice cream, Mother. I'm kind of hungry, Mother. And Jackie said, Reba, if you don't want to do this, we'll go home. But if you do, you'll be living my dream. And it was so hard when, when Reba lost her mother, you know, because yeah. that was the wind beneath her wings, truly. But, you know, look at Pake sings. Right. I think, I think Alice can sing, but she's a teacher. Yeah, Susie yeah. sings. Mm-hmm, you know, yeah. they all sing. Susie's good singer. You know, that school they went to was unbelievable. Their high school. Um, <coughs> they had a country music band class, and that's where they all learned to sing and play music. And did Pake tell us, like, five of them ended up becoming perfect. Yeah. The, one, the, the, the guitar player ended up being Alan Jackson's guitar player for life, you know? And um, Reba and Paik and somebody else came from there, too, another. Yeah, it was just a little school. I don't know if that was Limestone Gap or where that was. Oh, my. And uh, when Clem died, he had, they had a big estate sale, and I bought the record that they made in school. For, I got two of them from Clem's estate. It's the, the McIntyres. It's, the it's what it's called. Yeah, the singing McIntyres? Yeah, the singing McIntyres. It's the first record they ever yeah, made. Oh we my. have a copy of it. Oh, my. Stashed away back And Pake's not steer roping anymore, am I right? No. No, but it wouldn't surprise me if he wouldn't crack back out. He <laughs> he would retire for 10, 15 years at a time, and then we'd see him back at a steer roping again. So he's back to singing, though. He's, he's back to singing. He's back to singing, traveling around. Oh, my gosh. Has he got a band? I think he does his own Pretty much fiddling and uh, yeah. maybe has some music, background music. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's much of a band. 
Yeah. I didn't hear that. So they they interviewed him yeah. on the couch on the on the stage of the Ryman Auditorium. You know, as what was it like to grow up with Reba? It was more yeah. about Reba's. You right. know what she was like. Right. And but he talked about you know the first time they sang it in the bar at Cheyenne and different places, and they get mm-hmm. nickels, and mm-hmm. Reba would cry because she didn't get a nickel, and he got it all, or a quarter. He got a quarter mm-hmm. and thought she should have part of it. But, you know, that was pretty amazing. You know, don't you remember being out in the parking lot and there sitting on the tongue of the horse trailer playing a guitar and people around? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't remember because I was off getting trouble on her in the grandstands. Well, and that was, <laughs> With you know, Pink's daughters, you know. Chris Ledoux, you know, yeah. I mean, he'd I be in the grandstands, him and his mother and then his wife, and they'd be selling his his albums. See, yeah. And I always thought. I found some old sports news gas. here the other day with they were selling Chris Ledoux's and had his personal phone number in there to call uh-huh. him to, if you wanted to order an album or an eight track. <laughs> yeah. Thank God for Garth Brooks, you know, yeah. brought him. And now, you know, he's not background music. It's a story. I like to listen to that, those, that, those story songs. Mm hmm. When I'm quiet, so I can hear the story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same way with um, our friend in Canada, Ian Tyson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He just passed last yeah. year, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. But when um, help, he just died a couple months ago. Um, the singer, country music, Toby oh, Keith. Toby Keith. Love is music. Mm-hmm. And so um, the radio had. 36 hours of Toby Keith nonstop. I never realized some of the songs he made. He had a lot of songs. Like 40 albums yeah, that he'd won. Yeah, a lot of number won. one songs, yeah. And what an amazing, really amazing yeah. man. L- look at the country folks that we know and we've yeah. heard and have helped us get down the road. And right. Well, look at Ben Johnson himself. We're yeah. sitting right here in his museum. What a, what a story that is, you know. Yeah. Caught a train to California mm-hmm. just to look after some horses and end up becoming an Oscar-winning mm-hmm. actor. Mm-hmm. John Wayne's right-hand man, right? Supposedly. Mm-hmm. Only yeah. in America. <clears throat> Only in America, truly. And there's not as many fans as there was for whatever reason. Right. But doggone, when there's a good Western comes out, there's a lot of people that go see Still it and watching. enjoy it. Yeah. But I think it's... They're the, hungry for it. Those yeah. men like the two of you that are keeping the West alive and our friends driving down the road that get to spend an hour with you all and, and laugh with right. you and cry with you and say, I didn't know that information. I right. mean, thank yeah. you for what you both do. How do you, uh, you make a lot of products and sell a lot of products, Sharon Camarillo, saddles, bits, everything, I think. Well, I think I'm a designer. Where do, where do we... Uh, <laughs> Where do we buy that stuff at? Well, I, I've got a website, SharonCamrio.com, and I've got a barrel racing superstore. But we've got Rainsman and Circle Y have road reps on the, on, on the road, so you can see the Sharon Camrio saddles. And I'm personally a little prejudiced. I think they're the best saddles on the market. They're not strictly barrel racing saddles because I wanted to ride in a pin of my cutter friends or my cow horse friends or my ranching friends and move cattle with them, and I didn't want to look like I was in a barrel saddle so it's not that it has a big skirt on it but there's just they sit you over your heels um it actually i started with the buster welch tree because i felt like that put me in a good position to do anything i wanted to do that's what i wrote a modified buster welch a modified buster welch and that's what i still still produce so i'm pretty particular they fit a horse nice this tree that we have i mean I've, i've cultivated it for years with court salary and then uh when i went to work for rainsman i was designing pads and bits and when rainsman was bought out by circle y steve tucker said sharon we need to know you're all in and courts had burnt and i'd stayed with courts after their fire about five years and uh, i guess i gave jimmy plenty of time to sell whatever inventory we had left but most everything burnt and uh, so i went to work for circle y and um, I brought certain stipulations, trees, leather, how I wanted it done. So, you know, they always say, you sing, swing from a different tree. And I said, I'm proud to do that because I'm going to always challenge doing the best we can for the horse that we're riding. 
But, you know, there's other women out there, too. Lisa Lockhart, like I say, Jordan Briggs, and, oh, love your Donna K. Rule. Oh, yeah. We got a Wenda Johnson right here in Pahuska. And Winda, now, We're real Winda proud was of her. a student years ago. Really? Her mother, years ago, would buy some bits that we did. We did some, um, um, I can't remember, the old fellow, and we made the little ported solid cheek mouthpiece. And Winda and her, and her, and her sister, and her sister went to a lot of the horse fairs and rode Mustangs. Wileen. Wileen trained, trained uh, Mustangs. Yes. Winda's a little more subdued than Wileen and a beautiful woman and mm-hmm. you know just love to see her run and ride and hope hope those women that are really promoting good horsemanship don't decide to retire for a while <laughs> how do you find out about your clinics is it on uh sharon okay and I, i'm cutting back a little bit i used to be gone 180 days a year and uh i just um I booked three destinations this year because my daughter's traveling with me and she has a difficult time being away too long. And we changed the format. We've always had 12 riders in two-day clinics. And there's obviously some down times, but we do demonstrations. We have the riders follow behind us. We do video critique. We bring bridles. We'll only change them out if we think we can benefit the control that the rider has with the horse, the communication. Um, So we've now cut each of the destinations back to three days, and they're one-day clinics with six riders. You can give a lot of one-on-one attention to We give them one-on-one. They probably get a week's worth of training in one day. Two sets of eyes, and we can teach them everything that we taught them in two days with some downtime in one day with less downtime. And they seem to, we've practiced it for a couple of years, and this year we decided to implement that. So, um, you know, people say, when are you going to retire? You know, I love to travel. I love to teach. I love to see the horses. I love to help the girls. And I love to travel with Stormy. So uh, I'll probably teach another few years, and then I'll travel on a cruise ship. <laughs> She'll be right back to teaching these girls barrel race, and I can about guarantee yeah. she's going to be like, what the heck? I uh, thought this was going to be fun, but this is boring not having Come on, you to cowboys. Do. This is boring. i got to get back to this deal. Maybe you'll go on a cruise ship with me and get your bathing suit on down in the Bahamas or something. Or I can't even swim. <laughs> How I about Ireland, swim. Scotland, Ireland? Yeah. My wife wants to go on a cruise. I don't want to get on an a airplane, honestly. New Zealand. Oh, I love to fly. You're an old stewardess, aren't you? I, gosh darn, you're bringing all my secrets out. Yeah. When I graduated from college, my dad thought I should have a job. I wanted to be a professional rodeo. I didn't have a horse to do that. So I appeased him. I took a job with um, uh, Delta Airlines, and I took every leave of absence they offered and I, I had some horses, so when I'd get my leave, then I'd head to wherever the rodeos were, and I'd jackpot, and I'd ride, and I'd work cattle. And then they'd call me back, and I'd go back to wherever my domicile was and go back to work for a few months. And then when I started dating Leo, every once in a while he'd get on the same plane, and we'd travel to wherever my you know overnight was. It was fun. And my folks utilized the passes and traveled around the world because they were travelers. And people would say, well, how come you don't travel more on the airline? I said, because when I'm off the airport, I don't want to go back unless I'm getting paid for it. Right. But yes, I was a flight attendant. Another friend of ours, old Lori Shoulders. Yes. She was an American Airlines flight attendant yep. for a yes, long time. Yes, for uh, maybe 34 years. or. She retired from there. She was yeah. a big-time flight attendant. And still looks attendant. beautiful. She is beautiful. But... uh. You ever, <laughs> me and Jimbo, we get all kinds of cowboys on here that own their own plane and stuff. Did you ever fly on very many planes with uh, cowboy pilots? Uh, small planes? We flew on a lot of small planes, but usually it was a, 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 right. a I'm not going to say certified, but yeah. a professional pilot. <laughs> Wasn't just some cowboy. And <laughs> me and Jimbo, we laughed. We, we wouldn't even think about no. getting in some of those well, planes. Well, Cotton Rosser would circle my house because it was. It was near a, a, run, a small airport that we had. He'd circle. I'd be outside riding or whatever, and he, I'd look up. He's cocked, and he's waving out the window. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we've had several cow- cowboys kill themselves, oh, you yeah. know, being cowboys, saying, oh, the weather's bad, but I can make it. Right, right. Um, 
what was it said you know. Steiner said said there's been a lot more cowboys killed on the way to the rodeo than ever killed at the rodeo you know that's so true and Jimbo I'm amazed truly that there aren't more accidents yeah there was just an accident not too long ago that was awfully sad but I mean we drive tired yeah drive fast we a lot drive of fast. in a hurry bad weather um, I'm just. I was in drunk. Tr- I was in junk old uh, trucks and stuff that were probably just dangerous to, to be in traffic anyway. Well, uh, you mix old tr- trucks, dump, and it sounded like drunk. I yeah. did. Yeah. Did yeah. You? <laughs> no, I wasn't drunk, but uh, in a junk coming truck. up, I did rodeo with some guys. It seemed like they drank an awful lot of beer while yeah. they were driving. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no. I, I love the fact, I'm going to go back to Jimmy and her husband, Bud Monroe, you know, both world champions. Both were um, in the politics and the, the boards of college rodeo and then professional rodeo. I mean, they brought so much to the plate with professional rodeo, but, you know, as a couple to rodeo together, I can remember Bud in Oklahoma City with his shirt off getting Jimmy's horse, horses iced just before the bronc riding, because the barrel race followed the bronc riding. You know, those couples that are rodeoed together, it's, it's really amazing. And you bring up the Steiners. Mm-hmm. Doggone, I love their, their history. It's a pretty impressive family. It's, it? it's a controversial family. Yeah. I stand up for them every time somebody wants to say something about yeah. them, and yeah. I say good on them, and God bless them. They are just delightful. We were down there that night that Bobby and Sid were inducted, you know, and I think it was Bobby saying, if you, and if you didn't like the way Sid did it, I've got news for you. We got another one coming <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just precious. Anytime I can see them, I just feel like I'm amongst royalty, really. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I rodeoed when Bobby and Jolene, Jolene rodeoed, and Jamie's darling, the daughter, and, and Sid was a character, and I mean, my son was a group, Sid groupie. He, Mom, they're Sid. Mom, they're yeah. Sid. You yeah. know, and they're yeah. always gracious. And always have mommy, time. there's rocker. You know, I mean, oh, you know, yeah. that's what everybody said. I don't even know why they're so controversial, to be honest with you. Because yeah. they, you know. I mean, make, I don't know why. They make puts their own p- rules. People's in p- yeah. people's mind that they're controversial. They're just yeah. rodeo cowboys and They to make me, their own know? rules and yeah. they stand up for what they believe. And sometimes yeah. that's. I guess that's just controversial to people. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm going to have to throw out that word Trump. I love him. I I don't know what our country's going to do if we don't get him elected. I really don't. He has believes in himself. He believes in our country. Um, We were better off when he was a president, and he'll tell you what he thinks of you if you don't. So I don't know what all of our listeners' politics are, but he's going to have one extra vote from the Camarillo household. He puts America first. I'll say that about it. I love it. Well, what about your podcast? You just mentioned it in passing a while ago. How do we hear any of those past episodes? Well, you can go to my website, SharonCamarillo.com, and we saved some. We We did 50 podcasts, and, you know, like you all, we're connected to the industry. So I could call Donna K. Rule, or I could call um, Rocker Steiner. I could call those guys and ask them if they would join me, Mel Potter, mm-hmm. Jimmy Monroe. We've been trying to get Mel Potter forever, but it ain't looking good. Well, don't give up. <laughs> Mel, we need you to call in. <laughs> yeah. Tell him you practiced on Sharon's podcast, and he did <laughs> such a good job, such a good job. So we, um, you know, I, I told the boys that I... Um, I took my podcast off the air as far as being fresh Mm -hmm. every, I did two a month. Mm -hmm. I just got tired of a schedule because it Mm -hmm. it really does take coordinating with whoever I'm going to talk to. It takes me a couple of days to research because I certainly want to showcase those folks to the best as you all do. And then to, to work with that, I worked with um, a really good network out of Phoenix and I just, said one day I'm, I'm just not going to do it and then I regret it and I still regret it the every clinic I go to well podcasts well you can you can listen to them again so mm-hmm. they're they're right. at sharoncamrio.com we've got a little history there and you know if you don't mind I'll say join me on our Facebook I have a public Facebook Sharon Camarillo sure for sure we're always rooting for you all and I 
I love you guys. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, thank you for doing it. This has really been a good mm-hmm. one, Kobe. Yeah, I appreciate it, Sharon, too. Learned a lot today, actually. <laughs> yeah, little, right. I'm always right. learning. Right. I'm always learning. That uh, What was it like at that national finals in L.A. that you fell in love with the Well, I had racers? my money that I'd saved. I had a matching white Levi outfit, Levi jacket and Levi jeans and we were at the top row and the everyone looked like they were about six mm-hmm. inches tall so i didn't have ringside seats then but i just loved everything about it especially the barrel racers um they in those days they like i said earlier they were in LeMay and pretty horses and those tails flying and they were fast and it was exciting the crowd was cheering and i that would be me so I started out with the goat tying and roping because, like I say, I could do a lot of groundwork. And I could borrow horses. It's, you can't do that in barrel racing. No, no. Steer open's about the same way, too, really. No, yeah, absolutely. Not, you have you don't see very yet. many, if any, people borrow barrel racing horse. That's just... I don't think it... Do you know anybody that's just jumped on someone else's barrel racing horse? and Only in the fact that well, um, you know, several of the girls ride other people's horses, but they have trained those horses and they've got them on the road, or they, you know, the people have trained them and then they're the, they haul them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So they they have the management control of those horses. I would say that's. Yeah, there's a lot of nowadays <clears throat> going on like that for mm-hmm. sure. They're just hiring the best jockeys they can. But just to jump on somebody's horse and make a run. I mean, I think a lot of some of the girls have some backup horses they may not be real familiar with at the national finals. Yes, ma'am. So it's not like the bulldog in it. It's not like the bulldog in it at all. And you know, today's national finals rodeos, I just don't know how those contestants keep up because they've got sponsors that are, you know, keeping them on the road, and those sponsors expect them to be represented at the mm, national sure. finals. So they start early with breakfast in the evening with award ceremonies or the early afternoon, run down, try to get ready. They've got to have somebody to help them to get their horses out during mm-hmm. the day when they're signing autographs over at the trade show. Um, it's, it's busy. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the girls keep their horses off grounds and then have to fight the traffic to get them back on the grounds in time for the rodeo. Yeah. It's hard enough for a, con- uh, a a fan to get in the rodeo, yeah. let alone the doggone contestants parking and yeah. finding. I think there was one performance horses. this year that the the president was in town and all oh, the roads were blocked. That a lot of people couldn't even get to the rodeo to watch it. it was over oh, my before, word. No. before they got there. Yeah. That was the day after the doggone shooting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. And they, sh- can you imagine they cl- shut the rodeo down Thursday night, opening night. I don't know. That was a big decision. Yeah, I, I, I never did quite understand that. They. I guess they... Um, Other than it, well, I'm not even going to get into it. Well, and they brought the students from the college. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's on the college campus. They brought mm-hmm. the students over into the Coliseum. That's where the parents went and picked them up. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a pretty big deal in our, in our book, yeah. to cancel opening night yeah. Yeah. national finals I rodeo. Know. I know. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's oh, pretty unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what now were you guys out there I with, lost you, it. you were no. here and you heard it yeah, and you yeah. said what I, right i'm gonna call somebody no opening performance I'm actually gonna, it was going around they were going to cancel the whole dang thing back here you yeah. know like oh. they're not even gonna have it now so i i just couldn't believe the logistics you know we've got what is sixteen thousand? i think eighteen thousand with student uh, with standing room only you know to have to reimburse and we never got reimbursed until the first of february one night, it's not that big a deal, but I shared my tickets with some people that only had one night. And then your tickets weren't even good for Wednesday then, was it? On that morning, you slack, get. you couldn't even get in, could you? Uh, it was only... I mean, you probably could, because you had... Well, you, I think they got... Thir- I think each contestant got 13 passes. So grandma, right. grandpa, and the cousins, and the right. kids, and people could get in. It was pretty empty, and the cowboys loved it. Really? They enjoyed the quietness of it, yeah. the organization of it. So they did the best they could. They made the best decisions. And yeah. Well, it wasn't it so loud. And never happens again. 
first well, and last thing. There's always a first and last, yeah. right? Well, it looks like it's a bright future for rodeo for right now. So Absolutely. that's what I'm happy about. Yeah. Bull riding, PBR. Oh, yeah. We got. We live by the motto once they get too big to rope, we eat them, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Around here. <laughs> well, I, I like to see the cabs are a little bigger this year at the NFR. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a politic about it. They get the little cabs, they get fast times, they get, yay, we're mm-hmm. cheering, you yeah. know. But the, the, looked like the, Bulldogging steers were a little bigger. The calves were a little bigger. Times mm-hmm. were a little slower. Right. But at least the cattle had a little bit of a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that as a fan. Yeah. Well, we're all sure. Stockman as a cattleman. Yeah. Steer roping. I mean, right. what right. do you look for, sure. for, Cody, in a in a good steer, in a good draw at a, at a steer roping? <laughs> Two horns and four legs. That's all I needed. <laughs> Give no. you a chance, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I liked a kind of an old-timey steer with a little bit bigger horn and uh Kind of a, maybe a little sway back and a big sit feet. standing up a little bit. They I like a big good. Feet, I like a good big foot yeah. for sure. A little a little light on the heels, so yeah. you know where to. Sh- how how long of a rope do you use in steer roping? Twenty six, isn't it? Something like that. Really? That we use between a twenty five and a thirty foot rope. I used a thirty foot rope and just tied it off at the end. Tie a little shorter. No, I tied mine off longer because okay. I could throw a little more rope reach. than a lot of the guys. Yeah, but. <laughs> I'd probably have won a lot more money if I had tied it out shorter, running up, taking a, a better shot. You know? So the majority of headers, are they using 32 foot? I don't know. It looks like foot? they're throwing 32 feet sometimes. <laughs> oh, my God. At least, yeah. Have you have you ever seen a more remarkable uh, job on the header side as the national finals this year? I, I, I can't believe somebody can throw a rope that I far. I can't believe. And, catch one. I, and get dallied. Yeah, and get down and handled their horse, and then mm. you got Junior coming in, and boom. I'm glad I'm not trying to make any sort of living with a team rope. Controversy in that looks call very, very, when mm-hmm. they flag that team out, mm-hmm. arena yeah. record, and right. go around. Yeah. That was a lot of money. Yeah, I think that opens the door to instant replay, like a mm-hmm. like. Why don't they call. do it when they have it available there? Yeah. I mean, if they can't tell nothing by it, just the, rule, the call stands. Yeah. But if it mm-hmm. obviously was a bad call. On an instant replay, mm-hmm. change it, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. if you have the capability. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can even change it after the rodeo, honestly, because, I mean, how many times have they changed bull rider scores after the rodeo and then, you know, the judges, Wrong hey, a guy broke out, but they, the announcer didn't get that, so they got to go back and change everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not over till the secretary right. says sure. it's mm-hmm. over and the checks are written. Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't even know why they couldn't even go back on instant replay on – Things well, like that I, I hope they do in the future. There's too much money up. Yeah, it's a serious business and now. And though they're getting thirty-two thousand, is it thirty-two thousand dollars for a go around? It's I crazy. Thirty it plus. Much. I'm not sure the exact so, numbers. That's a lot of money. Sure it is. And in our day, at Oklahoma City in the early '70s, we got thousand dollar go arounds. Mm-hmm. That was a whole lot of money to us because gas was yeah. I don't know twenty dollars. Maybe dollar twenty five a gallon, and yeah, you know, less. hotels were less than a hundred. Oh yeah, and um, it was a lot of money. And right. I think, in perspective, when we're looking in California at five do- eight dollar diesel, right, and you break all that down, there's not a lot of difference in the profit you put in your pocket at the end of the year. Right. You know, I don't think gas ever broke a dollar till the Desert Storm War. It was always under a dollar until then. That's the very first time it went over a dollar. I remember it when I was a kid. I couldn't yeah. believe it. No one could. They were all talking, holy moly, gas is a dollar. Somebody said on Facebook the other day, said, can you believe Junior Garrison only won $26,000 uh, for winning the calf rope in 1965 or, or 1967? You know, and said, now they rope for $30,000 go-arounds. And I put on there, said, in 1967, and this is the truth, you could buy eight new pickups for $27,000. And now it wouldn't even buy a... a Clark McIntyre bought four ranches. Yeah, yeah. So money went a lot further. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's two ways of looking at that. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. You know, you look at uh, our barrel racers like Brittany Posey. She's remarkable. I've watched her grow up. She, w- she could ride off a, the hair off of a horse as a little girl. She may not look very organized doing it. But she's honed her horsemanship skills. She rides good horses. Some of them are hers. Some of them are not. But regardless, she honors each one of them. She went into the finals, what, $160,000 in the lead into the barrel race this year and kept that lead all the way through. Mm-hmm. 
It was, it was, it was amazing. And I have to say, this year's national finals rodeo barrel race was the best I've ever seen. You know, out of those 15 riders, at least 10 were horsewomen. I don't understand how they keep getting faster on the same track. It's, it was a, it, well, I think it's the bloodlines. Those doggone horses can excel and, and you know, gather pretty, pretty mm-hmm. easy and learning how to run through those turns. Mm-hmm. Um, those girls are patient on their back. They have good rapport with their horses. Um, any given year in the past history, I'd have to look hard to find three good horsewomen. Of course, I'm horsemanship heavy. Mm-hmm. I admire that. Mm-hmm. I might rather win third and do it right than take the chance of winning first and hitting a barrel, being out of control, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and if I feel like my horse is not supple or responsive or doing what I feel like he does, that's when I go back to the arena to tune up. I always pick three performance outcomes during the week to what I'm going to make better to go back the next time I run. But, uh, you know, don't like to have them on the barrels as much as people, you know, a lot of times the greener riders, that's all they do is they train them on the barrels. Uh, I want a cowboy on them, rope on them, ride them out, make them happy, make them responsive, make them want to work, take them to the barrels when they need it. Right. Well, the most aggravated you'll ever be in your life if you get on a horse that's never been outside the arena. I guarantee you'll be aggravated when you get off that sucker. Um, it's funny. Of all the years I've taught, I can tell the story about two sisters out that lived out around Miles City, Montana. They came to a South Dakota clinic, and um, I said, we're going to need to shorten your stirrups. Well, the stirrups were laced. Hmm. <laughs> they're not going to shorten their stirrups. They had big buckaroo saddles. I said, honey, I, both of them, I so respect what you do outside. But when you come in this gate into the arena, you better know what you're doing. You better have your equipment adjusted to help you with your performance. And I said, that's something for you to figure out. But at the same time, Brad Germanson was doing a bronc riding clinic at the same time in a different arena, and they rode in his bronc riding clinic. So, <laughs> out around Mile City, Montana. You had a couple cowgirls there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buckaroos. I love that when um, Haven Majid, he, he's a out around Mile City, Montana mm-hmm, sure. kind of mm-hmm. a guy. And isn't he remarkable? Yeah. Now Roping he's married dude. to a world's yeah. champion yeah. breakaway roper. Breakaway roper. roper. Yeah. What yeah a, I like him. What a world champion family right there. <laughs> yeah. That's something else. You know, rodeo is a family sport. Really is. A lot of the same people rodeoing today, their grandpas were rodeoing. And it's just a tight little circle. How long ago? So many of them, have, there's a connection. They're all connected some way, you mm-hmm. know, or something family wise or related or mm-hmm. something. You know, it's, a, it's really a pretty small circle. Look at how many mutual friends we have. Oh, yeah. So we yeah. could talk about mutual friends all day long. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I love those people. Yeah. We're inbred. Let's yeah. just say yeah, there you we're go. inbred. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. <laughs> But you, you can't find better friends for sure. And on Facebook, it's fun when, when uh, some of my old-time friends ask to be a friend mm-hmm. you know, on Facebook. And I hope you all do that are listening to this pos- yes. podcast. Yeah. Join me, please. Absolutely. I'm going to have to go back and listen to some of hers. I bet there's some oh. good ones in there. Right. Oh, that'll be. Can't wait. Yeah, listen to Mary. SharonCamarillo.com. Yeah, Mel used to fly all the cowboys around. Yes. My dad was one of them. You know, <clears throat> he loved steer roping and steer ropers. And uh, heck, he was the, uh, the, uh, the guy over the steer ropers for a long time mm-hmm. in, the, in mm-hmm. the PRCA. Well, in his book, he'll talk about some of the close calls, you know, making two rodeos in a day and landing on a dirt strip to run oh, yeah. over across the <laughs> pasture, you know, to get to the rodeo. Somebody would have his saddle Probably Wendy, because she was a road warrior, his wife. She drove the horses a lot. My sister-in-law and I, Gerald's wife, Liz, was my best buddy to rodeo all over the country. We'd take the horses, because Barrel Racer needs a horse. Gerald and Leo, a lot of times, would make three rodeos to our one. So they'd fly, and we'd meet them with the horses. And What was their practice pen like? Um, Gerald and Leo's. Well, let's see, at Gerald's house, about uh, 
450 feet long, and I'm going to guess <laughs> two, 275 wide or oh, so. Oh, wow. That sounds like the arena I grew up with. Yeah, sounds like the one here in Pawasca. Plenty of room to, you know, you're riding a young horse. You need to follow him down there and rope mm-hmm. him when he's ready. And the smaller pins, you know, when you force that throw, you're not doing much for you or the horse. So we always had a longer arena where we could sure. tune our horses. And, you know, at our house, I don't know how many. Here we are on another tangent, another story. Who's drinking beer, huh? <laughs> Bring another one. Um, I've dried more tears across my kitchen counter than I can, than I can say, from T. Woman to D. Pickett to Jake Barnes to uh, Tommy Self. Oh, who else? Joe Beaver was in and out. Martha and Ari were in and out. But the guys that roped with Leo, they'd come in, have a Coke or have lunch, and... And just, I can't, I can't take it. You know, boys, he'll make you or break you. He's tough. I mean, he's made me cry many times, but, you know, finally suck it up and look what you're getting done. So, um, you know, many years, you remember when they, um, it wasn't a team. It wasn't header and healer championships. It was a team. So. Yeah, it, yeah. one guy would win it. Whoever won the most money the on the team rope in that year. So Leo and T roped together all year. I think T was, I don't know, $120 ahead of Leo. And, of course, I said, well, get another partner and try to win the championship. He said, no, because I need T next year to make a living. Mm -hmm. So T won the championship. D Pickett, same way. You know, Leo was a businessman roper. Um, I love that. We, We nominated Reg Camarillo to be in the Hall of Fame. Can you imagine Leo and Gerald are in the Hall of Fame? Reg Camarillo is the third man team of the Camarillos that mm-hmm. changed the face of team roping. So Period. I hope he, he gets yeah. in. But um, those guys would sit across the counter and, you know, they're away from home, California, like tea. I had Leo was usually on a diet, so I'd cook for tea or took cook for Leo, T wouldn't eat anything green. He said, you know, any given day of the year, greens might kill an Indian, and I'm not going to take the chance it's today. <laughs> <laughs> so there, that was great fun watching those guys grow up oh, and their families and their success. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I'm going to go back. I wish I'd have kept a journal. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, out there in California, they did have – Long score, big cattle team row. I think they still do. Salinas. Salinas. Mm-hmm. Oakdale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. There's still some big, big team ropings out there. You know, I think just for the advantage of the roper and the horse, uh, the, the politics of the sports have shortened those scores up a little bit. You know, Jimmy yeah. Rodriguez, we nominated him in last year, and he was inducted into the hall, and he told some great stories. But his dad was such a character at Salinas. We always loved that rodeo. Because I loved it because I could go watch the Rain Cow Horse Riders and I can ask the Bobby Ingersolls and some of those great riders, you know, how do you count your stop out? You know, how do you get those horses, you know, lined out to whatever the case may be? Um, but Jimmy's dad would stand behind the box and he had a horn and he knew everybody's business, who they were drinking with last night, and he didn't hesitate to say, well, how are you feeling today? Look like you were celebrating mm. last night a little early. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was, it, was, it was a show in its mm-hmm. own right to mm-hmm. be there at Salinas, and they had to let those, you know, I, I don't remember all the rules. I think they came out of the healer's box. The header came mm-hmm. out of the healer's box, and... But, you know, going in that area, when Leo and I got married, I'm an educator. I like to teach. And we were able to work at a lot of the Indian um, Indian areas. What do mm-hmm. I want to call it? Reservations. Reservations. Reservations type. Yeah. And the, the government had made some beautiful fairgrounds for those folks. Mm-hmm. So we would go in for about three years, and we, we taught at most of the major Indian reservations. And so Leo and Gerald would usually do some kind of a demonstration, and and you know the the Indians never showed up quite on time. We always called it Indian time. We usually mm-hmm. like to start at eight thirty. It's still known up, as that around yeah, here. They'd yeah. show up mm-hmm. at eleven, and whatever. We just got used to it because you know. 
And then I have to laugh at one of the Ben Johnsons, you know, when he did his celebrity ropings. Leo and his partner, there was a draw pot, roped together. The header missed. Leo from the healing box roped the horns, traded ropes, let the guy rope the heels, you know, and they were still 14 Mm -hmm. on three loops. Uh, You know, just fun things that those guys could do, figure eight the horns. You remember Julio Marino. I've heard of him, yes, Mm -hmm. ma'am. An amazing trick roper, Mexican Mm -hmm. boy, trick roper, married into the Cotton Rosser family, Mm -hmm. was married to Cindy. And, uh, you know, those guys lived with a rope in their hand. Tea, doggone it. We'd go to bed in California, and two in the morning I'd wake. We'd go to bed with him roping the dummy. Two in the morning I'd wake up. Yeah. You know, I'd tell Leo, doesn't he ever sleep? Sounds like I crude. Did you have any superstitions? Rodeo superstitions? Well, we carried a rabbit with us. Remember that (laughs) story? Well, yeah. Four rabbit (laughs) feet. (laughs) Oh, I don't remember them at this point. I still don't put my hat on the bed. No, never stay on bed. You know, I don't either just because I don't want it to prove I'm right or wrong. Yeah. You know, so we won't do that. I I know a lot of rodeo guys. They're the most superstitious people I've ever met. I know a guy who wouldn't uh, change a shirt if he got to winning. And Ooh, yellow was a bad color. I've heard yellow is a bad color. Right? Wasn't yes, ma'am. it yellow? Yep. Don't mm-hmm. wear yellow. There's T- some other ones. Tough enough to wear pink. I'm glad pink don't is Don't eat is peanuts a good or something. Yeah. I don't remember. There's a bunch of them, but a hat on the bed is really the yeah, main that's one that's ever stuck with you. And I carry a hat box everywhere I go. I, I love wearing hats. Um, love the hat makers, love the boot makers, love the clothes makers. I've been able to design for Schaefer Outfitter. Work for Rio or Mercedes, um, Atwood Hat Company, and, and love being able to put my two cents in to what I like. Yes. But I, you just can't know the number of questions I get on a hat box. Is that a cat box? No. Is it a symbol box? Are you carrying an instrument? Do you have a snake in that box? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a hat box. Yeah. Well, heck, we sure appreciate you coming on, Miss Sharon. SharonCamarillo.com. Check out all her stuff she has. Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm honored to be able to be in a Dorsey for MVP, uh, Wrangler. I've been with Wrangler for 40 years. Love wearing that patch on my butt. I don't want to wear any fancy pockets. I just want to wear the good old-fashioned Wrangler. They're still the best pants made. Yeah. Wrangler. I yeah, I love them. And I had to laugh. I teased them this year because... You know, gosh, some of our other brands are making all kinds of cute little clothes for men and women, jeans. Wrangler made Barbie. They're bar- they came out with Barbie this year. And, you know, doggone it, the national finals, people were lined up buying the pink Barbie shirts and mm-hmm. cute as could be, really. But they are the cowboy jean, you know, thanks to Jim Shoulders and some of those great guys. They're the best. Yep. I don't like any of the other jeans, really, yeah. compared to Wrangler. Like Wrangler butt, you know what to <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. I guess since once the sponsor of the podcast, I might give them a try. I don't oh, know. yeah. <laughs> well, that, Wrangler do you it. know, and Ariat does a great job. You know, Beth Cross, we, she's, we put her name in this year for the Calgary Hall of Fame. And like I, I told her, my word, 24 years when they started Ariat, Lariat, mm-hmm. Ariat. Um, they've made such a difference. Multi-million. Two little, two girls out of, you know, college. They were English writers. Not much, you know, what did we wear? We wore um, uh, Roper boots, Justin Ropers, which they wore out in about three months when you were washing a horse, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost I still like have a pair of old Justin Ropers. Made of that. cardboard. And then here came Justin, and they asked me if I would help them with some design. But the only sh- boots they had were lace-ups. I said, well, I can wear the lace-ups sometimes, but i got to dress up. I'm, I, I like fashion. I'm going to wear, fa- you know, mm-hmm. cowboy boots. Sure. So then they started in the cowboy boots after about a year, year and a half. They've done a remarkable job, really, with clothes. And, and who in the world would have ever thought that hooey? Stick horse? Mm-hmm. You know, I, right. I feel like I have a hand in raising some of those guys when they came to me at the... Uh, Denver market and they said what do you think of this stick horse bull rider 
Okay. And do you think we could do three barrels and a stick horse? You know, you can probably do anything you're brave enough to do. And doggone, it's a multi-million dollar company nowadays, mm-hmm. starting with those little stick horse caps. Yep. Crazy. That's something else. Yeah. And Kimes, you know, they, they came in out of necessity. You know, they rode uh, pleasure horses mm-hmm. and reining horses. And, you know, people have complaints on the jeans. They're not high enough in the back in a saddle. Um, the eyes aren't loose enough for steer mm-hmm. rope, <laughs> steer wrestlers. And, um, you know, Kimes made some adjustments, you know, to those requests. Mm-hmm. And they've got a good brand, too, but I'm, I'm a Wrangler girl. We need to hire her to be our new fashion advisor, Jimbo. Oh. <laughs> She's got it. Speaking it's of fashion, you're looking pretty sharp today in your Hawaiian oh, shirt. Yeah. First day of spring. That. This is my. Well, now you see me wearing a flowery shirt. That's it's spring. Take Spring's it to the here. bank. You're the, the bank. you're the new groundhog. Better than the groundhog. <laughs> it's better than the farmer's almanac. And I wear a flowery shirt. It's springtime. Spring Don't plant your tomatoes yet, but it won't be long. I noticed that. I thought that was pretty snappy. I'm usually a, a five pocket snap shirt, mm-hmm. and Wranglers and a cowboy hat, a good pair of boots. And but over here at the Mercantile, over at the Pioneer Woman, oh yeah, she's all about flowers. Yeah, you she, know she brings a unique class into the ranching environment. Yeah, she classed us up a little bit, didn't she? And anybody she's that, fattened me up is what she's done. <laughs> she just fattened oh me up because her food's too good over. I right. had the best filet I've ever eaten in my life last night. Wow. That's some of that good Osage County beef they gave you there. It's fantastic. Baked potato was delicious. Um, gift shops are fun. Um, hey, you got to go check yeah. out the Buck and Flamingo store on your way out of town. I'm going to. That's our, that's that's our what, store. You're going to love it. When you guys let me know, that's where I'm going. Uh, I saw that street. I said, I'm going to shop here before we leave. We do got some other big news. We got the uh, Saucy Calf restaurant fixing open right here. Right. It's probably going to be a new sponsor of the show. <laughs> Traditional Native American food. Traditional Native American food. <laughs> oh, my food. gosh. Yeah, that's Cody's new venture. One okay. block from Like here. he needed another venture. Native yeah. American, so it's going to be Osage County beef. Yeah. and Yeah, it's, it is. All the beef. Even the vegetables are going to be raised here in Osage County, aren't they? Correct. For the yeah, we're part. getting them all right from the tribe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the meat, meat pies and just Indian delicious tacos. fry bread like you wouldn't believe. Navajo tacos, you call them out there, but they're mm-hmm. Indian tacos here. Yeah. Do either yeah. of you guys have any Osage blood? I don't, no. but I married, he married one, me. and I made two Osages with her. So yeah. I'm proud father of two and married to an Osage. Tell me how old they are. Well, one's 13. One's about... 11, I think. 11 and 13. Two little girls. Okay. Daisy I'm, and Ellie. I'm pro- Are they got ropes or barrel horses underneath them yet? They're into every single thing. They hadn't specialized in anything yet. They're basketball, track, softball, barrel racing, roping. Good. They get to choose. You name it, they're they're into it right now. So we're really having a hard time specializing in anything because we got a full-time schedule. Keep on so when I love the Killers of the Flower Moon book. They were in that, too. Yeah, Daisy, yeah. Daisy had a good, I mean, you saw her quite Daisy a bit. made the Oscars. She, yeah. Uh, when they were showing the Killers of the Flower Moon, when they were fixing to give some award away, Daisy, her big smiling face was just right there on the Did big they, screen at the Oscars. Were they extras? They were, yes, They're, ma'am. So in the book, I mean, I was there. Bob Feist and I went to see opening night in our little town of Click Killers mm-hmm. of the Flower Moon. I said, I can't wait to see this. But uh, you're one of those cowboys that you get head rights nowadays. No, ma'am. Sure. <laughs> I a- married a, 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 a broke Osage girl, so she don't have the head rights. <laughs> I mean, that was quite a deal, wasn't it? What was the... That's a true story, yeah? It's oh, all yeah. 100, 100% factual. And, and the thing about that story is that's just one family's tale, you know, is the only conviction they had out of... But they were murdering people for a long time Mm -hmm. leading into that that particular case Mm -hmm. so it was a problem before during and i think even afterwards but that's the only conviction they got so that's really the what was the name of that rotten rancher out there william hale william and he has a bad rap well he was the 
he was the one behind that particular family's demise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he mm-hmm. he pretty well killed off everybody in in the whole family, Burkhart, except Burkhart. one of them. He was a nephew to him. Yep, and kind of got talked into it, mm-hmm. you know, and went along with it. Well, in the book, it insinuated that that's the start of the um, national FBI. FBI. Yep, and that J. Edgar Hoover came down. He was part of it. I don't Before know if he actually FBI, came. But yeah, he, I, I didn't see him on the movie. I saw a Texas Ranger. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, that was the first agent they hired, mm-hmm. um, Tom White. Texas Ranger. Through this Federal Bureau mm-hmm. of Investigation. There wasn't a Federal Bureau of Investigation mm-hmm. at no. the time. So, long story short, the Osages themselves, they gave the federal government $25,000 to start this investigative branch of the government. So it was the Osage's money that started the FBI. So they got the ball rolling, and I think they called it something a little different, federal investigators, but I, there wasn't the B in there, I don't mm-hmm. think. But um, it eventually became the FBI as we know it and the original director of the FBI. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's Hoover. Yeah. He, uh, he stayed around for a long time, you know, but they hired him to start a special branch of the government. They wanted educated uh, investigators, people that, so they never even investigated a crime the way they investigated mm-hmm. this one. It was a whole new way of investigating crimes and everything. Mm-hmm. But uh, fascinating. Yeah, the, the Osages paid to have the FBI started, and had to pay. For this it. was their first case uh-huh. ever. I, 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 what do I say? Romantic's not the word, but to love, I love the Indian legacy that. Comanches, the Cherokees, I think we totally took advantage of them. I mean, here we gave them this com- this community, and I don't know what the percentage of Indian versus white is, but well, this was all this was white. Indian territory yeah. at the time, and um, and we move in, you well, know, like we do everywhere else. The Osages, they were a special tribe. They're the only tribe to own the reservation, so they bought this from the Cherokees somehow, and. That's how they end up with the head rights, which is basically mineral rights, and uh, mm-hmm. no one can ever take those away from them. Yeah, right? well, I say good on them because doggone government tried every which way they could to get the advantage and moved them over here. Yeah, moved them into a, what they thought was just a rock pile, nothing yeah. but yeah. you know, and it turned out, they turned out to be the richest people in the world. So. And they did Hit that the in the yeah. Black Hills, and then they oh, yeah, we got gold. We got to move you guys. Right. Yeah, it was so fascinating because. The Osages at the time were the the richest people in the world as a collective group. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, probably like the Saudi Arabians are now. Mm-hmm. That's how the Osages were then. Mm. You know, the first cars other than black that uh, Henry Ford made were blue and red ones for the Osages. Because the richest people in the world mm-hmm. wanted a car. Colors. With colors on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, an incredible story around here. And, you know, it's right across the street. On the second floor of the building over there, there was a Pierce Arrow dealership, and they also mm-hmm. sold Roy's, Rolls Royces there. Oh my. The only dealership you could buy, Rolls Royce or Pierce Arrow, west of the Mississippi, was right here across the street. Mm-hmm. And across the street over here, have you ever heard of uh, Crockett Bits and Spurs? Yeah, absolutely. Well, their first shop was across the street Oh, my from gosh, here. okay. So, Pahuska. Yeah, right Crockett. here in Pahuska. So we just got such a melting pot of... So when I... We drove in the neighborhood yesterday, and there's some... Great old turn of the century, 1910s, 20s, wooden homes. Some are remodeled and look fantastic. Some are kind of run down too. Mm-hmm. But it, it just made me feel, I don't know, like in some other life maybe I was involved in this whole situation. But did the Indians have neighborhoods like that? The Osage in the 20s and 30s? Did they, they did. buy big houses too? Well, a lot of them lived in the country. In fact, I live in an old Indian house out in the country. They were allotted 640 acres, you know, and they built these big, nice houses on them. But then a lot of times they decided they wanted to move to town. You know, you live out in the country. You're mm-hmm. a long ways from everything. So a lot of those houses got sold or the land got sold, and they moved to town to some of these big houses. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of them might have been Catholic boarding schools at the time oh sure some uh, of the up on anyone the hill? watch the new yellowstone yeah. there's a you know you can see what was going on there so the new yellowstone is the fifth season out well i don't know no, the one, that was, 1923 i think uh-huh. oh yeah, yeah. fantastic yeah. I, I, it's, you it's know a, taylor sheridan love him or hate him 
I think he was as true to the authentic depiction of what happened as any anything that was ever written. Mm-hmm. And even the modern one, you know, a lot of the ranch guys, that seemed like a lot of the guys I went and, you know, <laughs> ranched with. You've you met know? him before? <laughs> Seems like some of them, yeah. <laughs> well, Not those particular guys, but, you know, Sher- uh, Taylor Sheridan sure wrote a good part Oh yeah, for a lot of these cowboy guys. Well, Forey, who doesn't have to act at all, um, his father was married to my son's nanny when I was traveling, Irma, mm-hmm. Irma Lewis. Yeah. Ellie Lewis was an old bronc rider, and that's Forey's dad. No kidding. Yeah. It's a small world now. Well, it is. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But he's fantastic, you know. I love I love that show. And you guys, I, I'm amazed at how long you can keep your fans listening on the radio. They must be on a tractor. Oh, they're gonna. They're, they're really. Corn. They're li- really looking forward to this one because Jimbo had hip surgery a few weeks ago, and we've I think we've had three or four weeks just putting reruns out for people. So oh my. They're. Re- they're real ready. We've had some three and four hour ones. So. Oh my! Well, I'm <laughs> yeah. honored to be a part, and I I think you know, when friends can just share history, and you're not telling me a story, and vice versa, and we know what you're talking about. It's so mm-hmm. interesting. Right. You know, sometimes people want to talk about things like, and you're going, I don't know much about that. It's mm-hmm. interesting, mm-hmm. but I've, we're already. My brother, bless his sweetest heart, he's an architect engineer he's a conspiracy theorist and kenny if you're listening i love you dearly and with all due respect and he's an amazing um linguist or a conversationalist because he might start out on listening about the steer roping and just shortly that's a little similar to the aliens that came in (laughs) and you know when they you know Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you know kenny we're on chapter four of that story i gotta Mm -hmm. have a break or maybe another beer or something, you know, (laughs) but, um, it's, it's amazing our history and to be able to talk about rodeo history and whether we've known them personally or not, we know the names, Mm -hmm. you know, Clem McSpadden, how did we get a better man behind rodeo and Donna and a sad story there, you know, that, and the McIntyres and oh my word on and on the shoulders, Donna, I miss those women. I'm a member of a program called Hands, Helping Another Diva Survive. It was started by Donna McSpadden, June Ivory, Sharon Shoulders, Irene Harris from the East, uh, Nell Shaw, and they, they put 50 women together. That's what we have today is 50, still 50. And we pay a small donation, $50 dues. And that money goes to, you know, when we hear somebody in our family, rodeo family, have a loss, a child, a, an automobile accident, hip surgery, we, we send them a card. If, if we think they need the money, we'll send extra, but the hands send them $200. We care. And uh, those women, those five women, were my mentors. And when I came in as a younger rodeo wife, I mean, I wasn't young because I was flying as mm-hmm. a flight attendant. When Leo and I got married, I was 27. He brought me into the ranks of the rodeo. First secretary I met was June Ivory, and she turned me upside down. What in the world were you thinking about marrying this guy? <laughs> but I loved them, and I met Donna McSpadden, gracious woman, mm-hmm. heels and skirt, and just keep up with Clem and Sharon Shoulders, and Jim, and I said, I'm going to be like those women right there. Yeah. And I think there's several of us, Kendra Santos, that we hear so much great work that she keeps us up on the news. I mean, we've, we've been mentored by those women. I don't For sure. Know, I don't know who we have to date. I don't, I, don't, I don't know who the young women coming are in. Are looking up to and are, are being are, mentored by. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great people. Yeah, we were lucky to know some of those people. You know, well, Oklahoma. Yeah, you had to know. Yeah, that's true. You had to vote for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure, right? Right. <laughs> I knew Clem pretty good. Yeah, he was a good fella. What's the age difference here? I'm 67. I'm. A, I think I'm 45. 45. Not sure. You think? 
I'm in that neighborhood. Well, you didn't know okay. your kids how Did, old they were. So if I don't know how old my kids are, what yeah. makes me think I know oh, how old I am? Well, let's that's say true. there's a 20 year difference. Right. But you have so much in common. And what right. a great podcast you guys do. I can tell that whoever you bring in, you've got, you're, you already know them. You, you made this podcast so easy for me. You made it easy. Well, well, we know well, the lifestyle, period. You know, pretty much on everybody. We know you, even if we don't know you. Yeah, because we don't know you. <laughs> Rodeo's a pretty small. Well, ask me world. anything. I mean, I have no, I have no skeletons in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I do, so you don't need me talking. No, about no, that. we don't need to talk about. Skeletons. I don't need another ex-wife, Jimbo. No nope. I, I talk about skeletons. Last night at the hotel we stayed at. I left a light on in the bathroom because I just felt like there might be haunts. Mm -hmm. I just Could felt be. like there's a story here. Right. There's been a lot of different folks coming come this, in and out. This museum is haunted. Is I mean, it? You know, not in a bad way. I mean, yeah, you know, they came and did a ghost show here once, right, even mm -hmm. right. looking for him. The funeral home, which has been here a hundred plus years, is just right across the street here. That was the first business in town. Right. Funeral. So you got the funeral home right there. Plus, you've got all these old cowboys that are honored back here with their saddles. You haven't been back there yet. I can't yet, wait but, to go, yeah, go through the but, museum. So there's all kinds of reasons, I mean, for this to be have some, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, some we had a strange spot. whistler come through one time. Was, we haven't uh, yeah. figured out what was going on. Yeah, our, our his security camera picked up just a whistling on it a nobody in here yeah it was a johnny come marching home yeah oh my gosh which is like an old civil war it scared thing. the lady working here to death scared her to death because okay. we went back and looked at all the footage and everything we couldn't figure out where this <laughs> whistling johnny come marching home was coming from and uh and it was it sounds crazy it was moving through the place yeah yeah looking, looking around yeah because well, we could hear it loud one place then get softer and softer and then we'd hear it loud on that camera right there it's crazy yep. we don't know <laughs> there's no explanation for it so in a in 150 years who's come through pahuska besides cowboys ranchers oilmen yeah old man old con men, men yeah. ton of them con men. back yeah. in the day went well Indians. the richest people in the world yeah everybody descended on here you know to Outlaw, get a little bit of Outlaw. that money Outlaw. J. Paul Getty had a lease just right out here at west of town, and he he spent time in Pahuska. Bonnie and Clyde Bonnie and stole Clyde. a car from the hotel here. We might have stayed in Bonnie and Clyde's room if you they spent been. the night up there and took a bath. Bob Dalton was the first chief of the Osage Police from the Dalton gang. Oh, my word. After he retired from no. the Dalton No, before, no before, this before, went before. This is before no. they went on no. their uh, big outlaw rampage. Him and his brother... Both. They were all uh, yeah, lawmen. Yeah. Uh -huh. Dalton. <laughs> the Dalton gang was lawmen. Yeah, yeah. Jesse, you know, Jesse, all the famous outlaws you ever hear of, this is where they ran to back in the day because this was Indian territory. There was no FBI or anything to chase them on to Indian territory. You know, they just had guys like Bass Reeves out of Fort Fort Smith, just yeah. Old West lawman type that, you know, they would they could come on and looking for somebody. But, but they had so much ground to cover, you know. Oh, boy. All... A lot of uh, a lot of the criminals from back east, Pretty Boy Floyd, and all of them, they were all running to Indian territory to hide out. It's a good place to hide from the law, too. My grandmother was a James. Oh, really? um, my mother mm -hmm. and family is from Missouri, Ooh. and so I'm proud to be seventh generation mm -hmm. Jesse James cousin. Hmm. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. How the heck did your cousin Frank live so long? He didn't get wrapped up, and they didn't take him out or nothing. He he lived a nice, hey, long life. Yeah, he went to prison for a little while and then got out and lived to be an old man. Huh. Frank James. So yeah. so Jesse was the renegade of the... Well, they both were they outlaws, both were. you know, but Jesse got killed and, and Frank uh, went to prison for a short time, I Pat, believe. Pat, who killed Jesse James? Was uh, that Pat? Uh, ca uh, dirty little coward, Mr. Howard, yeah. shot Jesse James. Yeah, mm -hmm. Pat Garrett killed Pat Billy Garrett. the Kid. Oh, Garrett killed Billy the Kid. Yeah, Billy the Kid, he's about one of the only outlaws that didn't run this area. But they said, you know, he originally came from Wichita. Yeah. So he could have been running yeah. in this area yeah. just as easy. Bob, Bob Ford was the guy's name that killed Jesse James. That's he's supposed to be his cousin. Yeah. Oh, he Coward Bob him. Ford. Yeah, well, he, the dirty little, the song went, the dirty little coward that shot Mr. Because Jesse James' alias when he was trying to go hide out was Mr. Howard. 
So the song was the dirty little carrot that shot Mr. Howard. He was in his house, and Jesse James was straightening the picture, and Bob Ford went up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. Did he have a ransom out for him? Uh, I'm sure, I mean, a, a reward, a, yeah. Uh-huh. But Pat I don't Gar- think he ever collected it. Pat I don't Garrett think Bob Ford ended up very that. much of a hero for killing no, Jesse. No, he had mm-hmm. a song real band, Dirty Little Carrot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, some of those guys, they robbed the rich and gave to the poor, didn't Yeah, they, they? kind of had a... Robin Hood mentality, or, you know, whether they really did or not, but that's the way they were perceived. When we were in, in uh, Springfield, we went through the Wilson's Creek battlefield, mm-hmm. which was the second largest um, Civil War battle mm-hmm. wow. and the second largest death toll. Unbelievable. I mean, to see out wood, wooded, you know, wood, wooded, Piney Woods, mm-hmm. and those guys would line up 2,500 north and south. That's crazy. And on your mark, it said, shoot. Yeah. Would you do that? I'd be up behind a tree yeah. or a rock. Yeah, I'd be yeah. up in a tree, probably. Right. That's the way they fought, you know. Until well, they Revolutionary started that, War. That's the way they, from Europe, the, the British, and so that's the way they fought. They just line up. and. That just seemed like a crazy way it to It doesn't fight. make yeah. sense to me. But then we learned Indian fighting here, and they'd hide behind trees and stuff, and the soldiers would hide behind well, trees. Johnny, the, the, the old the Johnny Horton song, he explains yeah. it all to you. Yeah, hid behind it. Well, the cotton bale, wasn't it? Yeah, they right hid man? behind everything. Yeah, they hid behind everything. And why not? Yeah, shoot, yeah. It, then they build an alligator full of cannonballs yeah, and powder just behind. behind. Oh. When we touched powder yeah. off the gator, lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. That's such a good song. I love yeah. the fact that you have such great recall. Yeah. Jimbo's rodeo historian. I love that. Ain't very many people dedicate their life to the history of rodeo. Jimbo's one of them. Well, I don't know if I dedicate my life to it, but I'm sure. Interested. He can't tell you I'm much. I'm interested in, in it. In the last 20 years, he can't tell you much, but yeah, you get down there to the golden era, he yeah. knows it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm thinking in my mind. I'm sorry, fans <laughs> out there and driving your trucks and tractors. Couple of things we'll talk about when we go off air. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, ev- to be continued. Yeah. Everybody, this has been a good one. Been Thank a you for coming one. on, Sharon. A great one. And I'll say uh, SharonCamarillo.com again. Yep. Everybody go visit it. Ask, Buy you some stuff. Ask to be friends on uh, on the Facebook. Now I'm going to tell you I'm not on it very often. I'm not a fanatic on it, but every once in a while I'll have a cup of coffee in the morning and see who wants to be my friend and mm-hmm. I appreciate your interest in the Camarillo family and our legacy and our contribution to rodeo. Definitely one of the most famous names in rodeo. I mean, yes. and it's just one of the foundations of rodeo almost yep. as far as a last name, you know, you got shoulders, you got Camarillo, you have, there's just a few names that really stand out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hands tails above everybody. Mm-hmm. The Lindermans. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks and, for coming on. Oh, I appreciate God's blessings to y'all. And you all out on the road, too, or those of you who are listening to the podcast. you got a great team here, so hang in there. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all next week. Thanks Thank for listening. You.